Thanks for asking. Thanks for your patience. We will begin the afternoon fun, right? Um, you've got, you all have been working on the senior design projects for a year now, and we're all excited to hear your results and your explanations and to pepper you with good questions, right? So welcome to NC State's Nuclear Engineering Senior Design presentations. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Borum just in case he has some particular instructions that he'd like to, to share. Yes, please, you know. We would like to limit the presentation of each group to 20 minutes and leave 10 minutes for questions because I know there will be a lot of questions. We have 10 presentations, but we will start with group number two to start the first. And then we go to group number one, and we continue in the original sequence, three, four, five, six, until then. And so we will call the first group, that's uh, the group of Dr. Uh, Mihai, you know, to come over and uh, to be ready and start their presentations. And good luck to you all. By the way, we have monetary awards for the best presentations. One little thing for the voting card. This voting card, we will use one side of the voting card for the best presentations of the senior design. And I would like to see three presentations, you know, that these are the best three. And on the other side, when we do the poster session for the graduates, you please will vote for two. So, and then we will collect and see, you know, how the ranking goes, and then we can give the money, which is the nice thing, all right? Okay, thank you so much. is event sequence analysis and systems analysis to support a full scope dynamic PRA framework for the Polestar Research Reactor. My name is Mae Wells. I'm Maddie Barber. And I'm Alex Chasen. Okay. And your advisors? And our advisor is Dr. Diakonisa. And the uh, industry advisors? We do not have one. All right. So an overview of our project, we are a multi-year project with the end goal of developing that full scope dynamic probabilistic risk assessment framework for the Polestar Research Reactor. Um, we are year two of the project. Our target this year was to complete an event sequence analysis to support that eventual full scope dynamic PRA model. Last year, the first year, built a foundation that we built upon, which included a master logic diagram, a heat balance fault tree, and an FEMIA or failure modes and effects analysis. So, a master logic diagram just goes through the logic of and asks the question of how can radioactive release to the environment occur. And a heat balance fault tree kind of follows the same logic as a master logic, logic diagram. However, it addresses transients that can occur as a result of an imbalance of heat in either the primary or the secondary cooling systems. We use traditional PRA methods to perform this analysis because in order for a dynamic PRA to be performed, first you have to have that traditional model set up in order to build off of. So this flow demonstrates what was done last year, what we picked up with the project in this year, and what we completed. So. Again, the master logic diagram and heat balance fault tree were the first two arrows on this. And that is what was started and completed last year. The failure modes and effects analysis and the initiating events analysis was started last year and we finished. And then we began work on event trees and fault trees, which are part of event sequence analysis and systems analysis. So PRA stands for probabilistic risk assessment. It is a systematic technique that investigates um, 
undesirable initiating events and their transformations into a set of possible outcomes and their consequences. So it includes both qualitative and quantitative methods of assessing risk that's associated with the operation and the maintenance of a nuclear plant. This year and last year, we focused more on the qualitative analysis and methods, and next year they can use the qualitative methods that we use to find event trees and fault trees and put numbers to it to do the quantitative analysis. So we're assessing risk, and that begs the question, what is risk? So risk has, like, it's a tripled set of a definition, so it has scenarios, the likelihood of those scenarios occurring, and the consequences of those scenarios happening. Cool. So a little bit about the Polestar. I'm sure many of you are already quite familiar with it, but it is a one megawatt thermal pool type research reactor. It is not a power reactor. It is used for research, training, and education, and service. It has pin type fuel consisting of either four and 6% enriched pellets that have zirconium 2 cladding, 25 fuel assemblies in a five by five square array, and three scrambleable control rods, but four total control rods. The fuel design, both mechanically and the materials of the fuel, give it response characteristics that are very similar to commercial reactors, which makes it ideal for study of this project, as we can take the lessons in the study that we've done on the Polestar and kind of use it as a benchmark to compare to industry. Um, Finally, there is operation in forced and natural convection modes. Force modes meaning that we have a primary pump that circulates water from the reactor pool through a coolant system to a heat exchanger, which then has a secondary coolant system, which pumps water from the heat exchanger to a cooling tower. We additionally have natural convection mode, which relies on, as you can imagine, natural convection. So the difference in density in the pool, which is how the water is circulated. Okay. An important aspect of developing a PRA model is to conduct an initiating events analysis. Um, so an initiating event is any event that can disturb normal operations of a plant, and it has the potential to lead to undesirable scenarios like um, trips and core damage. Um, now one special aspect of the Polestar is that at its current one megawatt operating scheme, um, it is not capable of undergoing fuel damage um, by uh, core damage. So um, for this scenario, we uh, replace the um, core damage benchmark with avoiding um, emergency plan scenarios. Um, however, there is a potential for the Polestar to upgrade to two megawatts in the future, so in that case, um, the PRA model would need to be revised to accommodate that. Um, now, there are two types of, in of um, initiating events um, that we looked at, internal uh, versus external. So an internal uh, event would be something like an instrument failure, whereas an external event would be something that comes from outside the system, like a tornado or an earthquake. Um, for this project, we limited the scope of our analysis to only internal events because when you introduce external events, there's a lot of variables and then the scope of the project can get out of hand pretty quickly. Um, now, initiating events are important for the development of event trees and also success criteria, um, which is the minimum system availability necessary to ensure success at the end of an event sequence. So to put that into context, we have our confinement system that we use to prevent uh, radioactive release and we have uh, two trains available normally. So the success criteria for that system would be one out of two confinement fans are operational um, in the event of a fission product release. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, so there are multiple uh, approaches to um, selecting initiating events. We based our selection process off of two main criteria, um, our operational experience and also the FAMIA that was built for us by the previous year's group. So uh, May and I are both student reactor operators, and we used our operational experience, um, as well as uh, access to the safety analysis report accident analyses to um, base our list. And also we, um, we used the FAMIA conducted by the previous year's group. So once you make your large initiating list of events, you have to refine that list to make it more manageable. So we grouped events with similar plant responses. So for example, a cold primary coolant slug and an experiment mishandling both result in a positive uh, step reactivity insertion. So rather than having both of those events individually, we grouped that into a reactivity and sturgeon group. It just makes the whole process more manageable and more simple when you're conducting your further analysis. So here we have our completed list of initiating event groups. As you can see, uh, we have our reactivity insertion group and that includes, but is not limited to, the examples that I listed on the previous slide. Now, failure modes and effects analysis is the foundation upon which our um, event trees were built. So FAMIA is a tool that identifies failure modes of important components within a system, and it tracks how one component failing can affect other components and subsystems within the main system. 
Um, so with this tool, uh, there's a caveat. It really only considers problems from hardware, hardware failure, but with the Pulsar, this wasn't really an issue because we don't have any software controlling our systems. Now, some of the benefits of FEMIA are that it is both simple to apply and it's straightforward. So we, as the, anal as the analysis team, we're unlikely to introduce our own error by um, incorrectly applying an analysis method. However, there is a major drawback in that it only considers a single failure mode at a time. And this is one of those things that really um, highlights the importance of a dynamic PRA because unlike the static PRA model, the dynamic PRA model would be able to consider multiple failure modes occurring at the same time. Now here we have an example from our FEMIA analysis sheet. Um, this is our confinement train that I mentioned in my previous example. As you can see here, there's a process that we go through whenever we conduct FEMIA on a system. We identify the component and its function. So for example, we have the confinement fan one, and its purpose is to generate negative differential pressure in the reactor building. And then once we identify the component and its function, we identify the failure modes and mechanisms. So failure mode is just the way that something could fail. So the fan could uh, fail to run, uh, it could fail to start, and that could be caused by a wiring failure or a motor failure. And then after we identify our modes and mechanisms, we discuss the effect on its entire system and how that failure could be detected. Now, we were lucky enough to have a foundation built for us by the previous year's group. Um, what they were able to accomplish was develop a partial instrumentation, primary and secondary cooling system, and demineralizer system for MIA. And we built upon that progress this year. What we were able to do was complete a ventilation for MIA, and then we also expanded the scope to electrical distribution. We completed the secondary cooling system for MIA, and then we also corrected any mistakes and omissions from the previous group, um, including those in instrumentation and primary cooling. And we also eliminated um, any irrelevant systems that they may have done. Now, the progress that we made this year allowed for the creation of event trees and fault trees, which was one of the more significant aspects of our project this year. So moving on from um, FEMIA and events, or sorry, initiating events analysis was event sequence analysis, which is used to identify the relationships between those initiating events and the responses of the plant and of the system. So it documents that response from the plant, starting from the initiating event, working its way through the responses of the plant all the way to the end state. It's used to determine the combination of events that can lead to an undesired end state, because for example, if you have an undesired initiating event and all of the plant systems respond as appropriate, the end state will not be undesirable. The results of this analysis are e expressed in terms of the event individual event sequences. So you take one single initiating event, for example, a step reactivity insertion, and you follow the plant responses by asking what happened next, starting from either operator actions, system responses, or any kind of function that will cause an end state. To do this, we kept in mind that most reactors rely on three fundamental safety react functions to manage risk those being controlling the reactivity and heat generation of the core, controlling the heat removal from the core, and controlling releases of radioactive material. So the systems we have at the Polestar that do this are the reactor safety system, which is responsible for trips, the reactor coolant systems, which are responsible for removal of the heat from the core to the environment, and the ventilation and confinement systems, which control the flow path of air from the reactor bay through a ventilation system, through our stack, and into the air. Um, Knowledge of these systems and their safety functions were then used to develop event sequences and create event trees. Event trees are asking that series of what happened next and showing um, the responses of the systems using either a success or a failure. Here's one example of an event tree. For the sake of brevity and time, we only included one of our more simple examples. And this is um, a loss of secondary cooling flow via a pump failure. So the first action would be an operator action, which is to restart the pump. Following that, if the operator is successfully able to restart the pump. Cooling is restored, so there is no detrimental effect to the system, and in, which is called an SSES, safe, st stable end state. If the operator is not able to restart the pump, they would then reduce power to the point that the secondary system would not be needed to remove heat from the primary system. If that doesn't work, there would then be a pool temperature scram as a result of heat no longer being removed from the primary system and the pool heating up. If that doesn't work, the operator would initiate a manual scram, if not that, the operator would remove the key, thus de-energizing the magnets on the control rods, forcing a scram, then flipping the console breaker, flipping the power to the, the console, the CRDP, which is the control room distribution panel, that does not work, a security alarm would go off, and then evacuation, which is part of our ventilation systems, would be initiated. So this is performed with the traditional PRA model, and it doesn't do a great job incorporating how like time weaves into an event tree. 
For example, the operator action of reducing power, if the operator is either nervous or not paying attention or was not well trained, they might take too long to reduce power. So even if they do reduce power, it wasn't done in a timely enough manner for the other responses to be unnecessary. Another example is you can see with the end states, the first one is cooling restored or SSES, and it becomes more and more like severe until you get to a loss of coolant or moderator through boiling, emergency services not notified, and unmitigated potential radioactive release. This kind of demonstrates that the more time this takes because every single safety function, either an operator action or a plant response, will take time, and if it's not done in a timely manner, the consequences of the accident get more and more severe. This highlights the need for a dynamic PRA model because dy dynamic probabilistic risk assessment is able to consider things such as the time operators take to do things, human failures, and that can then make the tree, for lack of a better term, less static and more dynamic and is able to show, for example, if the operator doesn't reduce power in a timely enough fashion, other events will happen rather than just a binary, yes, the operator did or no, the operator did not. So the systems analysis method we use to create our trees involved in this analysis um, is based on something called the immediate cause principle, which identifies the most direct failure mechanism. We use the immediate cause principle to start at the component providing the safety function and work backwards through the system to make sure that every component is hit and we didn't skip anything. By starting in this method, it prevents overcomplication and we're easily able to sort of check our boxes and make sure that there was no omissions. Systems analysis is demonstrated via the fault tree analysis, which I'll step into in a second because it explores these causes of failures. Looking at the immediate cause principle, we once again start with our three fundamental safety functions, which is controlling reactivity, controlling heat removal, and controlling release. So as you can see with the heat exchanger here in the bottom left corner, we take a look at it and we recognize, okay, what in the heat exchanger could break? And we sort of look at, well, there could be um, loss of heat transfer or loss of flow, which results in a loss of heat transfer. So then we would work backwards through checking each valve, vent, anything that attaches to the system until the entire system is accounted for. Now for our fault trees, they use basic logic gates to analyze one of these failure events I was just speaking on. Working with each individual failure ties the fault trees directly to the event trees. So anything that's noted as a system response we can directly tie to a fault tree and recognize where in that system response it could have an issue in itself. So for one of our fault tree examples, this is our primary coolant system. This was one of the first ones we designed through the main failure modes, working backwards, and it uses a transfer gate in the bottom right-hand corner. It's a little difficult to see, but it connects the demineralizer to the open primary loop, which is the only other system that attaches directly to the primary loop. As you can see, it's long going down, but that is needed as there are just so many gates and we need to address for every point of failure that could occur. So for a smaller system, looking at it, um, we sort of took one of the smaller branches of our primary coolant system, and you can see at the top, it's our loss of heat transfer, which either comes from, like I spoke on, a loss of heat transfer or a loss of flow. Um, the loss of flow comes from an OR gate, meaning that if either of these things happen, there's going to be an issue. So if there's an issue with the path, then there will be a system failure. Or if the heat exchanger itself is plugged, there will be a system failure. The same is seen on the side of the loss of heat transfer, where it could either come from a loss of flow or a loss of heat transfer, because it will result in the same failure regardless. Okay, so the future goals of our project are to perform quantitative analysis and complete the traditional PRA model. Um, as you could see, most of the work that we did this year was qualitative, so next year's job will be to attach the numbers and complete the model. Um, additionally, we want to um, model accident sequences in ADS IDAC, which is a simulation software for modeling dynamic scenarios. And then um, a full-scale verification of the dynamic PRA approach has not been demonstrated against a traditional PRA before. Now, because nuclear power plants are so much more complex in comparison to the Polestar, um, this project is actually a really good feasibility benchmark for potential industry applications um, because you're not wasting time and resources um, conducting it on a large system. You have this simplified Polestar that could um, provide a good <coughs> verification benchmark. Additionally, the completed model can provide guidance and insight to other dynamic PRA models. 
And as you can see, we have a continuation of our little um, diagram from earlier. Um, next year's goals will be to assign probabilities and failure rates to the event trees that we have to the fault trees, excuse me, that we have already created. Um, develop success criteria. Assess any or assess any potential radiological consequences, whether that be for one megawatt operations or two megawatt operations. And finally, to complete the dynamic PRA model and compare it to the traditional model. Any questions? <laughs> thank you, Mandy and May. Thank you, guys. And questions? Questions? Yes, please. Uh, so thank you for this good presentation. You did say that Pulsar is not as complex as uh, other reactors. It's still a complex system. And so the question is, what would you want to do to actually translate your work to a more complex reactor, as you put it yourself? So what is it that comes to you first that you need to do? Um, okay. Thank you. Um, so first would be the verification that the dynamic PRA actually compares properly to the static PRA. So because the Polestar, it's still complicated, but it's far less complex than a, like a PWR, for example. Um, we would finish the analysis on this system, and then if we find that it's actually a helpful tool for assessing risk and um, modeling plants, then that, was, that would be the benchmark that we use for, okay, this is something that is worth our time to invest in for conducting on actual full-scale power plants. Yes. Well, more question? Oh, yes, please. Um, to follow up Yosef's point about the complexity uh, of a pulsar, I would think a big variable that is difficult to manage is the, are the experiments themselves and what uh, you know what hazards they may present. Um, you obviously, you know, since there's so many opportunities to use this reactor um, in experiments, how do you try to extrapolate and cover the the domain of possibilities? Um, you know, for for hazards that maybe you haven't thought of yet. That one kind of is a challenging question. So currently we have a lot of pretty strict limits on and a lot of approvals on what kind of experiments we can have, which excludes fueled experiments in most cases and excludes, oh, thank you. Um, it also excludes like corrosive materials, flammable materials, things like that. So as of now, we didn't actually consider those simply because there would be no scenario in which those would actually be in the reactor and pose a risk. But currently there is a fission gas loop facility going into the Polestar that will have fueled experiments, will, which will definitely pr provide much more of a challenge, and I'd imagine a whole new list of initiating event groups, because it's not just going to be a reactivity insertion. There's going to be a lot more physics and a lot more chemistry that go into that. Just to build off that answer really quick, um, one of the nice things about the Polestar is that not all of the experiments are directly connected to the core, so they're separated um, with um, beam ports and shielding. So the experiments that are out of the pool, um, they would be yeah, yes, they, prevent, they present unique complexities, um, but it's nice that there is, in fact, like a degree of separation between the reactor itself and then the experiments. Um, however, if we were to do um, in-pool experiments, like putting something in a, um, in a basket and then putting it actually next to the core, I think that would, prevent, that would present um, complications as well. One more question? One more. I'll ask a quick one, how's that? Uh, so this is a lot of hard work, so congratulations on that. Where did you get a lot of the mentoring that you needed to, to learn a lot of the PRA aspects? Um, well, conveniently, our advisor, Dr. Daikanisa, actually teaches a probabilistic risk assessment class. And like, for example, I and I believe Alex were already signed up for the class, but at the beginning of the semester, he really, really pushed for us to take that class so that we could learn it in a way that would first benefit like our just technical electives to complete our degree, but also so that we could have an actual strong framework to complete the project and not spend the whole entire year just learning how PRA works and could actually use the knowledge we learned in the class to apply it. Yep. One last question. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Who? 
thank you to the group for the presentation. Um, you talked about this being a multi-year project and the fact that there were some errors and omissions that you had to correct from the previous work. And so going forward, um, how are you applying that and the turnover that you give to the next team to be able to ensure that you have the most robust model? That's, I think part of it is just making sure that groups do a thorough document review of the final safety analysis report. This year, Maddie and I were just at a very large advantage because we already were reactor operators. I don't believe that was intentional in the choosing of the groups, as there were reactor operators that had different senior design groups. So I think a, lo a lot of it was just kind of how the group ended up. But we have to write a report at the end that talks about all of the work that we did. And part of that includes like making sure that the future group reviews the final safety analysis report so that that document review can do as best as it can to prevent kind of like this weird gap in the knowledge from year to year. Thank you so much. And I think that we are done with this group. And for a reminder, this is group number two, not group number one. This is group number two in the sequence. Thank you so much for your presentation. <laughs> And now we are getting group number one. We have to make a reverse in the system. Group number one, please come over. Would you please introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Ashanti Myers, and these are my partners, um, Ethan Newhouse, Jesse Hines, and Zachary, Zachary Bevins. And we will be presenting today the fuel management and reload cycle limb for Westinghouse's two loop PWR. And your advisors? Our advisors are Maria, Mariah Abernab, Abernab, I can't say it right. Yeah. And, your, and your industry advisors? Uh, our, our advisors are Dr. Abramova and Dr. Ivanov, and then our industry are uh, Blaine, Taylor, and Baxter Durham. Westinghouse. Yeah, Westinghouse. Yeah. So our motivation for this project is that uh, our nuclear reactors are, are plagued with um, capital costs and outage costs. And what we're trying to look at is we're trying to look at different uh, loading patterns and fuel cycle lengths over a 20-year 20, uh, 20 period to see what makes it the most economically viable. Because whenever you shut down a reactor, you're losing uh, millions of dollars in uh, refueling and operational costs. But on the other side of the spectrum, if you operate for a longer period of time, uh, the equipment and the fuel is a lot more expensive. So we're trying to find the, find the balance between the two over time. So how are we going to actually uh, capture the multi-physics of our loading patterns that we're going to develop? Uh, we, are, we will be using ANC's Advanced Nodal Code 9, as it entails, as the name implies. It's a nodal code and standard kind of two-step nodal code where um, you kind of design your loading pattern, and then the code uh, takes your loading pattern, discretizes it into nodes, and fills those nodes with uh, two group cross-sections developed by a code called Paragon, which we did not use for this project. We only used ANC. So if we needed any certain types of enrichment or uh, uh, burnable poison loadings, we'd have to reach out to Westinghouse and have them provided to us. And then for our core, it's 143 and a quarter inch. So we can divide that into different nodes into these almost six inch nodes and perform two di diffusion in that uh, node and find the flux and then reconstruct it into the entire core, back it out and update for the, back out the flux and then update for thermal feedback effects. And then you can see your cycle length, uh, your power distribution, and uh, dish or burn ups of different assemblies and, and pins. And so how do we start with our, our design, our equilibrium core design, like we're doing for our 20 month period for our 12 month, eight intermediate month, or eight intermediate cycle length and 24 month. Uh, it is an iterative process in between in, out of core and in core fuel management, where out of core entails uh, initiating your cycle length and then 
estimating how many assemblies you're going to need and that average assembly enrichment. And then with that, you also need to kind of estimate your burnable poison loading so that you can control the excess re uh, reactivity required since as you increase your uranium enrichment, you need to increase your burnable poison loading. And then for in-core fuel management is the actual locations where you place your fresh fuel and where you shuffle your previously burned fuel. And for uh, longer cycle lengths, that shuffling becomes more, uh, more difficult, but you also have less uh, burned assemblies from different cycles. And then here we have a very simple equilibrium design where you're shuffling and feeding the assemblies in the same location for multiple cycles over and over again. And here we have a quarter core uh, a pin power distribution for our 13 by 13 two loop PWR. And um, for all these different loading patterns and cycle lengths, we need to run uh, multiple different safety analyses to make sure that uh, over this 20 month period, they pass a lot of the NRC guidelines. So what Westinghouse provided us with is uh, an RSAC method, or the reload safety analysis checklist, where we have uh, values given to us and we run different safety analyses at different state points. So beginning of cycle, end of cycle, middle of cycle, and at different uh, power points like 0, 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100% power, depending on what is the most uh, limiting condition for that specific coefficient. And we test it at six different coefficients, uh, our moderator temperature coefficient, our Doppler power coefficient, our shutdown margin, our rod ejection, our rod FDH, or max rise enthalpy hot channel factor, and our total power coefficient. And these RSAC limits are inherently less than uh, the NRC guideline limits, and we want to make sure that they meet these limits for all six state points that we're looking at. So in summary, the point of this whole thing is to find what is the most economically efficient option. And the trick here is to balance our fuel cycle costs with our, our reloading costs, because as our cycle length goes down, so too will our fuel cycle costs but the frequency with which we will have to reload and pay those reloading costs goes up. So we need to find the easy medium between the two. So Westinghouse has provided us with an economic spreadsheet to calculate our fuel cycle costs. We take inputs from our ANC code, uh, like our number of fuel assemblies, number of our burnable uh, absorbers, number of our uh, stack heights, effective full power days, assembly arrays, all that fuel cycle loading details. We also can supplement that with in-clash lectures on economic analysis things, such as our price per kilogram estimates for mining, conversion, enrichment, fabrication, carrying, storage, disposal, every step of the fuel cycle and fuel assembly process. Then we put all this in, and the spreadsheet will output a total fuel cycle cost in dollars per megawatt hour electric. Then we do some supplementary research to find our OM and refueling costs. So we can estimate our total refueling cost uh, per cycle for a two-loop PWR from the ANS website, and again, supplement that with our in-class lectures for our OM costs uh, in dollars per megawatt hour. And then we compare this to our current US energy cost to make sure we have it within the right range. Then we multiply our dollars per megawatt hour by reactor power, thermal efficiency, number effective full power days by 24, and that'll give us our cycle cost in dollars per cycle. Then we take this uh, up to the 20 year uh, range to find our total cost for a given loading pattern. And then we compare these in cents per kilowatt hour, which is the units that US energy is priced in. So the reactor we're modeling this two-loop Westinghouse PWR is comparable to what we see in all across the U.S. with a standard 13 by 13, so a small reactor uh, with only about 1677 megawatts thermal. Uh, and, to con and for our designs, we need to meet uh, three preliminary design constraints before we can get onto the safety analysis for our loading patterns. And that's a critical boron concentration of 10 ppm at our desired cycle length, so at our 12 month, our intermediate, and our 24 month. And then a, mo a maximum hot channel enthalpy rise factor, or F delta H of 1.55 for uh, all rods out depletion. And then a peak pin burnout of 62,000 megawatt days per metric ton. And it's important to note that for all rods out depletion, um, the core state at zero can be ignored, and that's because our core isn't at equilibrium yet. And to control this, and to design this, uh, we'll be using IFBA and Gadolinia. So IFBA is zirconium diboride, which is a uh, smaller, shorter-lived uh, burnable absorber as compared to Gadolinia, which is a heavy, has, has a lot much greater hold down and lasts longer into the cycle, and which will play an important factor for our 24-month loading pattern. And for our first design, 
For our 12 month cycle length, we've gone with a four batch uh, kind of standard low leakage loading pattern with 32 feeds and an average uh, enrichment of 3.84% at a cycle length of 340.5 effective pulled out full power days, which is a pretty much exactly where we were aiming for. Uh, it has a pretty low uh, pre boron concentration of 1074, and our uh, F delta H is, is well below the limit of 155, and a, a very, very good peak pin burnup of just under 55,000 megawatt days. And here we have illustrated our different enrichments and number of IFBA. It's important to recognize that small number of IFBA as we look compared to the other uh, cycle lengths. And here we have illustrated the uh, radial assembly power distribution. So this is if you're looking at the top down of the core at beginning of cycle, peak boron concentration, uh, and then also at end of cycle. And we can see that ring of fire show up with our fresh assemblies and are once burned on the periphery. And then as it burns out, it kind of becomes more flat. And uh, as you can see, the maximums are kind of towards the out. And then as, as it burns in, you have this kind of central assemblies that are also fresh. And then here we have illustrated our boron letdown curve and our F delta H as a function of core exposure. And you can see that uh, the boron is well below the fifth, around 1450, which is kind of close where you're cutting it close with a positive moderated temperature coefficient. And our F delta H is well below the limit throughout the entire, entire cycle length. Now for the safety analysis for this 12 month, uh, as I said at the start, we're looking at six different features. Um, in our presentation, at least for right now, we are only looking at the four most limiting constraints. Uh, so for the first two, we have our moderate temperature coefficient at 0% power, which is uh, our most limiting condition for it. And our RSAC limit that we're supposed to meet is going to be at uh, 0 uh, PCM per Fahrenheit. And as we can see, our curve looks very similar to what the boron letdown curve was on the previous slide that we just looked at. So, and of course, it meets our standard of the RSEC limit. And then for our Doppler power coefficient, uh, we're looking at it at 100% power, and we're looking at between uh, two state points of negative 8.465 and negative 19.332 over the course of the uh, exposure that we looked at before. And we did this at multiple state points. We did this at zero, 25%, uh, 50%, and 75% power as well, just to make sure that it is consistent through all of them. But our most limiting factor was our 100% power, and this is the uh, highest Doppler you're going to see. But the rest of the Doppler power coefficients that we looked at were well in between these limits. And then looking at our rotted FDH and our shutdown margin. So for our shutdown margin, we have uh, our required uh, rod worth of 1,600 PCM, which we're supposed to meet. And we test it based off of beginning of cycle and end of cycle. And at least for a 12 month, uh, we are well above the 1,600 PCM since we are at 2,800 and 2,600. And then for our routed FDH, we're looking at, our, again, our most limiting factors. So we have our routed FDH at uh, different axial offsets, which is where the power is pushed either to the top of the core or to the bottom of the core. And we look at both so that whenever we move our control rods, we, have, um, we can have enough time to make sure that it's not going to affect anything within the core. And as we can see, it passes our limit of uh, 1.574. And then for our second design, uh, we just we have for our 24-month design, we've gone with a two-batch low leakage doublet. So we actually have two two designs with this one. The only difference is shuffling remains the same, except for the center assembly is fed in one cycle and remain there for the next cycle. So there's flip-flop between the two, and half the core is loaded each time. And this is a result of exposure limits and burn-up limits on on for the peak pin. And we can see that with both these cycles that. The uh, peak pin burnup comes close to the limit of 62,000, with the even cycle having the greatest, and that's the result of that center assembly, as well as the uh, peak boron concentration being over a little over 1,300, but still higher with the even cycle with that one center assembly. So because uh, your reactivity, your total reactivity is going to be higher with a fresh assembly rather than a once burn, so you're going to need a little more boron. But we can see that our F delta H's for both cases are, are pretty good, our peak. Uh, well below the 155. And here we have illustrated our uh, average enrichment of 4.92, so close to the NRC limit of 495. And if you take a look that the uh, burnable poison loading for both is significantly higher than that 12 month with almost 6,000 rods, IFPA rods, and then 
uh, almost 300 gadolinia rods. And here we have illustrated the loading patterns uh, for these with the standard low leakage and then a checkerboard in the center. And you can see how the, uh, that single fresh assembly remains in the same cycle with the red being fresh and the blue being once burned. And then here we have illustrated our cycling scheme. And you can see this flip-flop between 61 and 60. And here we have illustrated the radial power distribution at BOC peak boron concentration and uh, end of cycle. And we see that the previous 24 month does not have or only has two. That's because uh, this one will have a boron peak as a result of uh, burnable poisons burning away. And we can see that it begins with this kind of hot center. And then as corp uh, burns out, it becomes more evenly distributed with the fresh assemblies really showing their power as to compared to the dead, uh, ready to be discharged assemblies. And here we have illustrated the critical boron concentration and the F delta H for both of the even and the odd. And we can see that big burnable poison hump, as I mentioned, that starts low at 1,000 ppm and then it goes up to 1,300, but still below that 1,400 limit where you're getting close to a positive MTC. And here we can also see this kind of double hump where power um, kind of shifts from one region to the other as the burnable poisons burn away and, and the core depletes. So similar to this uh, boron letdown curve that was shown in the previous slide, our moderator temperature coefficient is also going to have that uh, hump in the middle because of the uh, more added burnable, burnable poisons. Uh, again, it still passes the safety limits uh, even at 0% power, and then our Doppler uh, passes both safety limits as well. It is to note that our Doppler is a little bit higher, but that is, again, uh, due to the increased amount of burn burnable absorber absorbers. And then our rotted uh, FDH, again, looks similar to the previous rotted FDH graph that we showed, even at the uh, different axial offsets uh, with all power at the top of the core and all power at the bottom of the core. And then we calculate our shutdown margin for both cycles as well, because we had an even and odd cycle. And both of them pass our 1,600 PCM uh, safety limit. And then for our final design, the intermediate, which we found to be the optimized, uh, it's kind of a combination between the 12 month and the 24 month, where we have this kind of standard three batch core that we see used in industry with the low leakage loading pattern and then kind of a, a fresh insert ring about a third of the way out from the center. And uh, we see that its enrichment is pretty much is very close to in between to that 3.87 and the 492 between the two uh, loading patterns with 44 total feeds also in between the 32 and the 60. With, as, and with this design, you can see that it's only controlled by IFBA, similar to the 12 month, but still has almost four times as much. Our results lead close to our desired cycle length of 510, effective full power days with 512 and a peak boron of, of, of good results of 11.43, and then a peak F delta, 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 delta H close to that limit of 1.55, but we're still under it. And then a peak burn, pin burn up that's worse than the 12 month, but better than the 24 month with just under 61,000 megawatt days per metric ton. And here we have illustrated once again our radial power distribution at beginning a cycle, uh, peak boron concentration, and then end a cycle. And as you can see, similar to the 24 month, we have that hot kind of midsection that as the core depletes, it burns away, release, uh, kind of having a more po even power distribution later on in cycle. And here we have illustrated our boron letdown curve and enthalpy rise hot channel factor uh, once again. And we can see that the uh, burnable poison hump is a lot less uh, severe with the 18 month as a result of the less hold down at beginning a cycle since it doesn't have any GAD as to compare to the 24 month. And we can see that the F delta H has a bigger play in terms of um, the burnable poisons burning away with that, that steep kind of increase closer to the limit, but still does not reach the limit. Safety analysis for the 18 month, uh, we again have similar results for our boron letdown curve for a moderate temperature coefficient, which again has a smaller hump than was observed for our 20 month. 24 month cycle, and then our Doppler power coefficient uh, also was observed similarly to our 24 month cycle, but had uh, smaller values overall. And then the real change is with our rotted FDH, because as Zach has mentioned before, we do not have GAD in this loading pattern, so our hump is uh, closer to the limit, 
as opposed to the other two cycles, but it stays below the limit even at the different axial offsets of the power being the most limiting condition um, for the core. And then for our shutdown margin, we um, calculated it, and for a beginning of cycle and end of cycle, it still stays above our 1600 PCM that is required to shut down. All right, so now to compare the cost of all these three different cycles. So for our 12 month, uh, again, we used 32 fuel assemblies and gets us about 340 effective full power days. So we found the total fuel cycle cost to be around $2.2 uh, per megawatt hour electric. Our OM and refueling cost per cycle is around 130 million, uh, which stretched out to 20 years gives us around $2.83 billion, with a break even price of roughly three cents per kilowatt hour. For our optimized 18 month cycle, uh, which uses 44 fuel assemblies and has around 512 effective full power days, we found it to be $3.44 uh, per megawatt hour for the fuel cycle cost. OM refueling costs are around $177 million, and our total cost is $2.68 billion, noticeably less than the 12 month cycle, with our break even price being around 2.926 cents per kilowatt hour. For the 24 month, as again, we had to use two separate uh, loading assemblies that were flip flop between which means we can just average the 61 and 60 fuel assembly results, uh, which would give us a total average fuel cost of around $5.085 per megawatt hour. Uh, OEM refueling costs around $227 million, uh, and total cost of $2.75 billion right in between the other two. And it's important to note that although the prices increase with each increase in cycle length, we are having to apply these OEM and refueling costs 1.5 times as many for the 18th month cycle as the 12, and twice as many for the, uh, or half as many for the uh, 24 month as for the 12. So looking at the comparison of the two, here is just the comparison of the break even price in cents per kilowatt hour of the th uh, three different cycle links. So you can see the 12 by far is the uh, least economically efficient. The 18 and the 24 are pretty dang close, but there is a 0.01 cents per kilowatt hour difference which doesn't look like a lot, but when we stretch that over a period of years, we find that the 18-month cycle saves you about $3.5 million per year as opposed to the 24-month, and saves you about $7.5 million per year uh, in comparison to the 12-month. So in summary, we have successfully created three loading pattern designs and found that uh, the 18-month is the most optimized, although it is very close to the same break-even price as a 24-month. And this is a result of just our, our design. Uh, it, it's important to note that with equilibrium operation, it's, it's very strict in how you load the core. And with the 18 month, we've discharged um, a lot more assemblies than, than you would than, uh, with the 24 month, where the 24 month pretty much, you, you're not wasting any assemblies that could be burned for another cycle. And also with equilibrium, you, you can't really capture reactivity changes if, if something happens during on operation that you don't know about. And you don't really have any op ability to take assemblies that may not have reached its, their lifespan life and insert them to help uh, reduce the initial loading cost. And also we could look into um, reducing our split batches because if you look at the previous, if we look at the batches are split and in general that might be, that, that can cost more than uh, what you would. And um, yeah. Oh, sure. Well, thank you so much. And we have room maybe for two questions. Is there anything else? <laughs> oh. Okay, just two questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, did you guys consider, it looks like you, you, when you did your economic analysis, you looked at the assembly costs and things. Did you consider the cost of your burnable poisons, your IFPA and, and GAD, in your economic evaluation? So this was less of an economic evaluation, more of just a cost comparison. Uh, and we, uh, we actually talked with Westinghouse about this, and more specific details like those are a lot more proprietary per company. And so the exact prices are not so much the focus as it is the comparison. And uh, the comparison between the three different cycle links will stand even as other variables are added because they'll be added un uh, uniformly across all three. Uh, another thing to add is we do account for IFPA 
Uh, but for GAD, we don't. I think that's just a more difficult calculation since it's inside the fuel and probably doesn't impact that much as compared to IFBA. Uh, so. For the sake of time, one more question. Did did you consider? Sorry. Doesn't matter. Did you consider like three three loop? Or did, how did you how did you select two loop versus three loop? So we were just um, pretty much told to do a two loop. Uh, we, we didn't really have much choice, but we do have a second group that is investigating the four loop that will be after us. Yeah. So there there will be differences. So but we've we've kind of just held with the two loop. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. So we call group three. You'll get an answer for the two. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Nafisa, start. Yeah. Um, welcome, everyone. <coughs> Uh, we are doing similar to the same last project. Oh, sorry. Um, it's also the fuel management and reload cycle length optimization of a Westinghouse for loop PWR this time. My name is Wafa Osman. We have Sadat Pollard, Vincent Wang, and Julian Colvin. Our academic advisors are also Dr. Avramova and Dr. Ivanov. And our Westinghouse representatives are Baxter Durham and Blaine Taylor. So I just want to apologize preemptively if I have uh, bags under my eyes. I spent 12 hours in Washington, D.C. yesterday trying to prove to naval reactors that I deserve to be in Rickover's Navy. It was tough, but I got through it, and uh, so I will be. So thank you. <laughs> um, hopefully today I proved that I'm good enough for a job for the next five years, so hopefully today I can prove I'm good enough for a job with one of you guys uh, five years later. So harsh. Uh, hopefully you'll remember this when I send you my application, or maybe don't. We'll see how it goes. Um, so we utilized uh, Westinghouse Advanced Nodal Code, uh, just like the last group, to develop a core reload, um, core reload pattern uh, to meet the very similar design uh, and safety requirements, uh, but this time for a for-loop PWR called Silent Hills. Uh, we also did a uh, very similar economic analysis uh, for our loading patterns, uh, as well as a safety analysis. So just to go through the outline here, um, I'll be covering the objectives at first, uh, then we'll go into the methodology. Um, Wafa is going to be focusing on the specifications of the loading patterns um, and some of the uh, design constraints that we have there. Uh, and then Sadat will focus on the safety analysis calculations. Uh, Vincent Wang and I will, will separate the economic performance analysis. Uh, then we'll end with conclusions and talk about uh, some of our our room for uh, continuing work on the, the project. So uh, our objective is essentially the same thing as the last group, uh, design three uh, different core loading patterns. We have a 12 month, 24 month, and an optimized uh, length cycle, which came out to about 18 months um, based on equilibrium conditions. Um, and then we perform the safety analysis uh, based on the given, um, the given parameters from Westinghouse uh, to validate our loading patterns. Uh, and then we did an economic analysis uh, as well, um, focusing on the fuel cycle costs, uh, outage costs, and generated revenue over a 20-year cycle period. So, so as far as the methodology goes uh, for our LP design, uh, we're using we're we're basi basing it off um, a previous cycle 23 model file, which was uh, provided to us by Westinghouse. Uh, we're using ANC to select uh, fuel assemblies. And um, ANC is a uh, 3D core calculator uh, that uses di nodal diffusion theory and uh, pin power reconstruction to uh, solve the reactive problem in um, two energy groups. And we're also using a uh, cross-section library provided by Westinghouse as, as well as enrichment, which our enrichment is between uh, 3.4 and 4.95. Uh, also, our burnable absorbers uh, we're using IFBA, which is uh, Integral Fuel Burnable Absorber, and Gadolinia uh, so to de develop our loading pattern. Uh, usually uh, with ANC, it's um, f four, um, excuse me, 
full core or uh, octant core, but we are using quarter core symmetry, and we're going to run the same LP strategy for eight to nine cycles until we reach our equilibrium. Uh, so for our equilibrium, uh, we're going to evaluate performance of fuel management over 20 years, a 20-year period. Uh, we're using identical fuel feed, fuel and feed enrichments, uh, identical fuel shuffling, uh, as well as burn uh, fuel, burn up, and uh, our energy requirements. So um, previously, um, used was <laughs> previous uh, LP designs used were using um, out in in which would be um, feed assemblies on the periphery with um, the burn fuel in the, in the center and a checkerboard pattern. We're using uh, low, low leakage, which you can see here, uh, where, we, where we have the burn on the periphery, uh, feed in the inside in the ring of fire, and um, twice and once, twice, and, and feed in the center in a checkerboard pattern. Um, so we're going to focus on eating or meeting our our production, our energy production, um, with our EFPD given to us by Westinghouse, as, as well as our enthalpy rise peaking factor, uh, which we'll refer to as FDH. Uh, so here are our, our limits, I guess, for um, for 12 months. We're doing 340, uh, 24 is 690, and our optimized, which is going to be 18 month, is uh, 510 effective full power days. All right, so we're using A and C as well to uh, calculate our safety analysis. Uh, our peaking factor, MTC, uh, DPC, our um, Doppler power coefficient, as well as our shutdown margin. And we're also doing a rod ejection um, accident results. Uh, and rod ejection is um, mechanical failure in the control rod pressure housing, uh, which would result in an injection of a fuel rod from the core, um, which is which is low probability, but very high consequences. Is, uh, consequences would be, um, I'm sorry, uh, a rapid increase in power, um, a rapid increase in fuel temperature as well as cladding temperature, and uh, departure from nucleate boiling. All right, here are our target values. Um, you can see peaking factor for all rods out, boron concentration. Uh, shutdown margin, our rotted peaking factor as well, and our peak burnup. And here are our uh, rod ejection limits. Uh, so we have maximum ejected rod worth, uh, maximum FQ, which is um, the overall uh, peaking factor, and then also uh, maximum burnup at the hot spot. All right, so um, for our fuel cycle costs, we're going to be focusing on uh, front end and back end. Um, so we're going to be going over the ore price, uh, conversion, enrichment, fabrication, uh, as well as our, our outage costs and generated revenue and spent fuel storage. So, so that's it for the methodology. Going into the project, um, a few values that we need to calculate later on are that the th thermal output at 100% power for the Silent Hills reactor is 3,626 megawatt thermal. Uh, this core contains 193 assemblies, which is bigger than a two-loop uh, two PWR. And historically, the 18-month cycle, which is what the Silent Hills reactor usually operates at, is about 90 assemblies. So starting with the 12-month cycle, our initial design was we, ideally, we want to replace only a third of the core with feed assemblies. So we had, using the low-low leakage pattern, uh, the figure on the left is our initial LP design. We have the periphery, we have the twice burned fuel on the periphery with a checkerboard pattern in the middle of feed assemblies and once burned fuel. However, at end of cycle burnup, which is calculated using the initial heavy metal loading and the, and the thermal output of this reactor, uh, which is 13.7 gigawatt days per MTU, our effective full power days was 314.31, which is lower than the target, which is 340. Also, we noticed that the soluble boron concentration was very negative at end of cycle, so we concluded that we needed more uranium to be fed into the fuel uh, into the core each cycle, which is when we uh, our final LP design after trying seven, uh, 73, 85, and then initially and then eventually we just went with half of the about half of the core, 
So we went with 93 feet assemblies, where the odd number comes from reinserting the center assembly each time. So, but this limits our uh, shuffling scheme in the sense that we only have four assemblies for twice burned fuel and mostly once burned fuel. At end of cycle, though, we, we reached um, target, uh, we reached a cycle length of 307 effective full power days. Um, with this loading pattern, we have our rotted FDH, uh, which was above the limit up to uh, middle, uh, middle of cycle, around 7,500 megawatt days per MTU. Uh, the fluctuations you can see in the FDH and the soluble boron concentration, this could be due to the amount of burnable absorbers in the, in the core. Um, once we increase number of fuel assemblies, burnable, burnable absorbers should have been um, a bit uh, decreased. Uh, since soluble boron concentration was high, you can see in the MTC graph, which is a, a function of burnup, the hot zero at hot zero power, the MTC was higher until middle of cycle, and then it came lower as the core depleted. Same with the Doppler power coefficient. For our rod ejection analysis, they were since we did not meet the limits, we the the output results did. Because were lower than the constraints we were given. However, for shutdown margin, um, it's much higher from the 1600 PCM at the end of cycle and beginning of cycle. Similarly, for the 24 month cycle, um, we used only 4.95% um, enrichment and we only have one burn fuel as we went with ha exactly half of the core being fed with feed assemblies. Uh, at end of cycle burnup, which was 28, about 28 gigawatt days per MTU, our, our effective full power days was 624.275. Similarly to the 12 month cycle, we have a rotted FTH and soluble boron concentration and it was a function of burnup higher than the limit. However, since we only had once burned fuel instead of a few twice burned, um, it went, the rotted FTH went down a bit linearly in the beginning until middle of cycle, same with the soluble boron concentration. Um, these missteps could have been because there are the, high, the highly reactive fuel is pla are placed next to each other. So the way to solve this would be to decrease the number of feed assemblies so we have more of a variety of the burnt fuel assemblies that we can shuffle for, with each for each cycle. Um, that could limit the FDH, especially in the, uh, in the middle of the core where the power peaking is high. Um, similarly, you can see that the MTC end up for, uh, at till, until about third of the way into the cycle is higher at hot zero power than the hot full power. And then also for like the 12 month cycle, the rod ejection results were much lower than the target, but the shutdown margin was very much higher. For the optimized length cycle, LP though, we tried something different. We added gadolin gadolinium in, in the core, where in the first two loading patterns, we only had IFBA and uh, with lower enriched fuel. Here we have enrichment between 4.2 and 4.95 weight percent to balance out. We also, uh, similar to the 12 month cycle, we have four assemblies that were twice burned and only, and the rest were once burned with our feed assemblies with the higher enriched rich feed assemblies on the, uh, in the ring of fire, and then the lower rich enriched assemblies in the middle. Um, with 93 feed assemblies, our end of cycle burn up was 20 points, about 20.6 gigawatt days calculated, and we reached 461 effective full power days. This time, because our use of gadolinium, um, our rotted FTH fluctuations were pretty, pretty crazy a little bit. Um, up until like a third of the core, a uh, third of the cycle through versus burn up. Um, and s same as a boring concentration, it was much higher due to the use of too much burnable absorbent in the core. Um, same can be seen and reflected in the MTC uh, plot, as well as the Doppler power coefficient. Uh, similar results for the rod ejection analysis and the shutdown margin analysis can be seen. And then for the economic analysis. Yeah. Um, so 
it's essential to like uh, uh, we figure out the uh, like uh, the most informed uh, uh, decision or uh, like and trying to figure out the most like um, uh, safe and uh, most uh, economical viable uh, nuclear design so we have to analyze the economic and uh, we have to do the economic analysis and uh, uh, what I'm trying uh, what I'm focusing on is on the uh, efficiency of the uh, resource allocation and uh, minimize the cost and uh, maximize the profit or the revenue and uh, do so so I did I did some research on the on the, on the historic average historic price of each component um, of the uh, nuclear de uh, design uh, of the three loading patterns and you can see like the graph in the uh, the, the trend in the graph and they basically like there is a sharp increase right before the 2008 and because of the expansion of nuclear power cap uh, capacity in countries such as China, India and uh, Russia and there's also uh, like a uh, e e financial crisis like uh, uh, at the 2008 and uh, there's also there were like two fluctuation points uh, like around 2010 and 2014 because of the Fukushima, what, the first one is a Fukushima uh, uh, nuclear disaster and the second one is like uh, due to the conflicts uh, between Russia and uh, uh, Western, uh, Western countries and there's a, like a economic section under Russia. And that uh, comes to the, to the same case for the conversion price and you that's almost the same pattern as the previous one and but there there's like a um, production disruption in Canada uh, around 2012 because of the uh, and and since like Canada is uh, one of the biggest producer uh, uh, of uh, converted uh, uranium so uh, the price like just like uh, uh, get impact uh, greatly uh, around 2012 and uh, because for the SUW uh, U price, the separate work price, and uh, because of the competition in the nuclear uh, fuel market, and you can see in at least in the recent ten years, the the market price goes down, and uh, uh, for the fabrication uh, price per uh, fuelable uh, fuel assembly. You can see there's a, like a, the price just generally goes up because of the complexity of nuclear fuel design, and which will cause more labor forces and uh, more uh, uh, like uh, energy to working on the uh, manufacturing process. And this will be just a table of uh, uh, like a different uh, uh, cycle lengths. This is a 12 uh, cycle lengths. And you will see, like uh, uh, the optimal one and the uh, uh, 20, 24 months cycle one, and uh, the the general uh, like pattern here is like you can see as the uh, we as the cycle lengths get longer, and we we have uh, so we we need uh, like a higher enrichment in the fuel assembly, and we. The price and the value of each component, such as yellow K conversion, separative work fabrication, and the pre-operation carrying charges, operation carrying charges, and spoon fuel disposal, all goes up. And uh, and yeah, and uh, I we calculate the price per megawatt hour uh, based on the uh, effect uh, uh, effective full power day and uh, the thermal output and uh, uh, some uh, things like a typical conversion efficiency, uh, like a 33%. So you can see for the 24 month cycle, the, the unit price per megawatt hour goes like to from four, uh, around $4 to $6.167. And for the optimal one, it's, it's around like a 5.184. Even though the uh, this is just for operation cost, uh, operating cost, and uh, we also have to uh, in our analyze, uh, in economic analyze, we also figure uh, like uh, count for uh, revenue and uh, outage cost, uh, things like uh, uh, like market demand, uh, comp 
uh, uh, comp competition as government policy and uh, geopolitical factors, we consider is like things like uncertainty factor. So we didn't uh, con didn't consider it in those in, and uh, so uh, we and also like the outage cost is basically the twice amount of. Uh, the operation operating cost because the uh, like a uh, unit price from per megawatt or from thermal uh, uh, power plant is like almost twice the unit price of uh, from the nuclear power plant. So, um, you know, as as you guys seen, we we had to handle some uh, volatility in in uranium prices. Um, over over time, and as you guys can see here, logging into my Robinhood, um, you know we're in we're in the green today for those of you who have invested in nuclear fuel. But a few weeks ago, not so much. So um, the the volatility of the prices is a hard thing to account for uh, when we're dealing with this. I actually called Cameco and I was like, hey, um, you know, can can you give us an estimate of where prices will be for the next few months so that you know we can kind of account for that? We we got. Uh, prices given to us by Westinghouse, and they were like, you know, who are you? And I was like, I'm an investor, please. They're like, how many shares do you own? I was like, it doesn't matter. So they hung up the phone. But um, yeah, so one of the things we noticed was with the change in cycles, as was mentioned with the last group, uh, the 12-month cycle had the, some of the cheapest, the, had the cheapest uh, fuel prices, uh, and then it kind of goes up uh, along, along the time period there. So, but uh, the reason that the optimized cycle length is 18 months, somewhere in between, uh, is that we have to account for the operating costs, uh, outage costs, and, and revenue generation. So um, one of the reasons, uh, initially, we actually had found that um, the opposite of what we were supposed to find, um, which was that the, um, the, 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 the trends were, were reversed, really. And so our optimized cycle length ended up not being as optimal as we had hoped. Um, but then we realized we weren't accounting for the outage costs. Um, and so once we considered that, the trends started to, to reverse themselves uh, and we got to where we are today, which is, is a much more accurate representation of, of what would actually happen in the industry. So uh, finally, we're in with some of our ongoing work in this area, um, as I mentioned, uh, still trying to get in touch with Cameco. I'm, I'm about to sell my stocks at this point, I'm fed up. Uh, won't make much money on them, but um, the LPs, you know, may not have met our, our ARO F, uh, Delta H limits um, or our target cycle requirements, but we do have a system set up now to where we know how to get there um, as we continue working on the project. Uh, you know, the main way of doing that is replacing a third of the core with feed assemblies instead of a half of it. Um, this will increase our enrichments and our burnable poisons, uh, and then we can adjust the shuffling scheme uh, with twice, twice burned assemblies in the middle of the core. So we just want to thank uh, Dr. Avramova and Dr. Ivanov for their help um, as our advisors, and then also thank Westinghouse for all the great help that they provided with us. Uh, I'm pretty te technologically inept, so they had to really, you know, take me through baby steps to figure out this ANC code. Dr. Palmtag knows what I'm talking about. Um, but we got there, we figured it out, and, and now we, we have a, a much greater understanding of the code, and, and we know where to go from here to, uh, to reach those, those constraints that we were given. And here are Questions? references. Thank you. Congratulations on going to Never Reactors. Thank you. Thank I worked there 26 years. So uh, you did an economic analysis in addition to the technical work earlier. How would you translate this to other industries other than Westinghouse? What do you think would be the difference? That question is to everybody. So specifically, other other parts of the nuclear industry, like other types of reactors, or other it's industries in general? Say right. Based on So I, I think there's some universal things that are going to be the same uh, regardless with an economic analysis you have to take into consideration. Labor costs, shutdown costs, all of those things are going to be the same. The fuel costs, again, are going to vary, um, you know, based on the factors that we were talking about, and that's something we take into consideration. Obviously, different types of reactors take different fuels. 
Um, you know, in my home state of Kentucky, Global Laser Enrichment's working on a, a new HALU facility in Paducah, where they used to have the gaseous diffusion and using the, the remaining uh, uranium tails uh, there in Paducah to, to hopefully make new fuel. Um, so we've considered the different types of fuel. Um, that, that would be different. Um, some, most of the other costs would, would, of course, be different, but based on the same principles. You consider labor, you consider how long it's shut down, you consider, uh, you know, a geographic location and, and, and materials and all that sort of thing, so similar. What, why was the outlet cost an afterthought? You can answer it. Um, we had just, we had, so doing those trials, we didn't meet the limit, the requirements. So we were more focused on getting those. Those were the economic analysis we would have to do after generating the LP designs. So once we reached that, we had sort of forgotten to, to account for the outage cost. But once we did the results, then results made sense. Because <laughs> initially, we were kind of confused why the results were reversed, because we knew the 18-month cycle would be the optimized cycle. But eventually, we found it out. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Um, whatever you, I hear the word okay. safe, safety analysis. Yes. I'm thinking that there's some treatment for uncertainties. I haven't heard you know, mention of uncertainties, but uh, you must have in some way accounted for that in, in your safety analysis. I'm not sure of your question. I'm sorry. Well, the parameters that ultimately you know drive. Uncertainties. Westinghouse provide you with um, parameters that are otherwise biased in some way that uh, assures that when you make you present the data or the results from your code mm -hmm. against a um, a criteria such as say F delta H that indeed you've considered all the factors that might otherwise influence that outcome. Um. Well, for this project, there are many safety analysis, like generally there are many safety analysis calculations that be can be done, but for the scope of this project, we only focused on a few, which uh, were seen, like the FDH and the MTC and DPC and so, and so forth. Um, but yeah, we didn't, we weren't able to look at all the calculations, just the main ones. Any other questions? at this. Good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can we just hold the mic? Okay, go ahead, please. All right. okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Banks Pete. This is my partner, Stephen Trainer. Our project is optimi optimization of pure elemental shielding materials for cost. Um, and we were advised by um, Dr. Robert Hayes, and our industry sponsor was Microshield. Yes, Dr. Eric, uh, yes. Dr. Eric Giovadani. Who's an alum. Yes. So our goals for uh, this project were to determine the best shielding materials based upon several factors, such as cost, volume, mass, and energy of photons. We chose to use uh, a few um, different materials. Uh, some of them were um, all elements in their pure form from Z1 to 92. 
we excluded any noble gases or liquid elements in that uh, atomic uh, number range. We also used concrete, water, and steel, which are commonly used shielding materials. Uh, in order to find an optimum shielding material, uh, we needed to create a shielding worth score at different aerial uh, densities, energies, and cost ranges. Uh, we used MicroShield in order to calculate um, our dose rates, uh, which later went into our shielding worth scores. Uh, MicroShield is a program for uh, photon and gamma ray uh, shielding and dose assessment. Uh, we can use it to calculate dose rates for different sources, shields, and geometries. MicroShield also uses the point kernel method instead of Monte Carlo. So um, the first step, and one of the most important, is gathering price or uh, pricing data for the elements. So we made two different price sheets, one that was um, the elements in dollars per gram, and then also we made an additional price sheet for the, like, the miscellaneous um, materials like concrete, 316 stainless steel, and water. Um, we obviously did our best to source these materials at the cheapest cost, which typically me meant looking at bulk pricing. Um, and a, a lot of the main materials, like the, the metals, we were able to find pretty up-to-date information on. Um, some of the um, less commonly used materials uh, we were still able to find within about five years. One thing to uh, keep in mind is since any of our conclusions involve cost, that um, obviously these conclusions can change as prices change. You know, if there's a, a war or a mine collapse, then the price of a material can change drastically. So these uh, these, uh, this analysis would need to be redone. So one of the primary influences of material shielding ability is that material's attenuation coefficient. Um, the attenuation coefficient is just the reciprocal of the mean free path of a particle in that material. And so if a particle doesn't travel as far in the material, then the mean free path is smaller, thus the attenuation uh, coefficient is larger. In general, the attenuation coefficient tends to increase with atomic number. There's a positive correlation. That's generally because um, the photoelectric effect, Compton scattering, and um, pair production, the probability of all those also tend to increase with a higher Z number. Next, when calculating dose rates, buildup must be accounted for. Uh, buildup factors are the ratio of the total number of particles versus the amount of um, uncollided particles at a certain point. They correct for scattered radiation and any secondary particles created by the uh, shielding medium. Microshield uses the Taylor buildup formula, which is shown uh, in the top right corner. Uh, the buildup uh, factors are dependent upon energy, um, mean free paths, which um, uh, is also dependent on the attenuation factor, which is uh, simply mu. Also, we have the parameters A1 and alpha1 also uh, dependent upon um, the uh, mean free path and energy. Microshield, thankfully, uh, has all of that information for us. Um, and so Microshield is able to calculate all of the buildup factors uh, for us. Uh, we also uh, chose the shielding material itself as the, uh, for the buildup material uh, within Microshield. Also, uh, we can see that uh, the buildup factors um, fluctuate with different energies. This is the buildup factors for barium at 0.5 uh, mean free paths. You can see it um, just increasing and decreasing uh, here in the photoelectric, um, and then the Compton energy range. And then, let's see. So now, uh, into Microshield. We first want to create our geometry. Uh, and to do this for our project, we started with a point source uh, with the location, and then we had a dose detector um, point about 10 meters, or at, at 10 meters from the source location. Then we placed a shield. Uh, we started with a one centimeter shield thickness, and later we will uh, get into the fact that we increased the uh, shield afterwards. <clears throat> Then uh, a shielding material must be created and selected. Microshield allows the user to create and save materials with their user assigned density. The space between the dose detector point and the um, end of the shield is referred to as the air gap. And the density of air was um, selected and applied to this air gap space. 
Then uh, for our source, we applied a one Curie activity in terms of photons per second in each of the 25 standard energy uh, indices, which are the energy indices range from 0 0.015 MeV up to 15 MeV. <clears throat> Finally, for uh, MicroShield, there is a sensitivity tab that performs dose rates with a varying shield thickness that we can use in up to 20 increments at a time. Uh, the sensitivity analysis was run twice for each of the materials, uh, once with a shield thickness from one centimeter up to 10 centimeters in increments of one centimeter, and then a second time from 20 centimeters to 100 centimeter shield thickness in increments of 10 centimeters. For our shielding worth calculations, we used the data from the absorbed dose rate column in units of millirads per hour. Maybe hard to read, um, but the absorbed dose rate columns, there's two of them, uh, one in millirads per hour, which is this second one, and then uh, milligrays per hour. Thank you. So now that we have all the, um, the numbers that we need, we can start calculating a shielding worth um, score, which is evaluating engineering terms. We're dubbing it sweet, uh, trademark pending. Um, the engineering terms that, that uh, we're evaluating are cost, mass, and transmission factor, like absorbed dose rate. So what we start off by doing is we take sort of a control case without a shield, and we take that absorbed, um, that, uh, excuse me, that uh, absorbed dose rate, and then we divide out the absorbed dose rate with a shield. So this essentially gives a unitless factor saying how many times the absorbed dose rate was reduced. Then you take the cost of that material in dollars per gram and divide again by that. So um, what that does is if you have a material that's very expensive in dollars per gram, it'll lower the, um, the sweet score more than a material that has a lower cost per gram. And then finally, you divide the material's density. Um, so essentially, if you had two different materials at the same shield thickness that um, have the same absorbed dose rate, a material, a material that's lighter will actually end up with a higher sweet score. And this is especially important for you know, applications like space shielding where the mass of a payload is um, vitally important. And then we compared these sweet scores at aerial densities. So um, to calculate the aerial density, you take the shielding material's density and multiply it by the thickness of that shield giving units of grams per centimeter squared. And the three different aero densities that we compared the sweet scores at were 25, 100, and 250. So this first graph shows the sweet scores um, for an aero density of 25 grams per centimeter squared. The z-axis is the uh, log of the sweet score. The, um, the, the other axis is the log of the incident photon energy. And then you have um, the x-axis being the uh, atomic number of that material. So at this aero density of 25 grams per centimeter squared, there's no material that's really good at uh, high incident photon energies. But keep in mind that this graph just includes the elements and does not include 316 stainless steel, concrete, or water. The follow this graph is uh, the same, the same, uh, the axes are the same, but it's now at 100 grams per centimeter squared. So now that the aero density is larger, that means that the, sh the shields, are, uh, shielding thicknesses are also starting to get longer, larger, excuse me. So that means uh, you can actually start seeing that at higher um, incident photon energies, the sweet scores are starting to pop up a little and it's starting to uh, smooth out. One uh, trend to notice is that at high uh, Z scores around here, um, you have, there's actually really low scores. And that's not because that materials like, for instance, uh, 80, Z89, atomic number of 89 is actinium. It's actually a very good shield, but it's uh, very impractical because it's extremely expensive. So those dips aren't necessarily because the material is a bad shield, it's just bad in uh, practical applications. This uh, final graph is um, the sweet scores at 250 grams per centimeter squared. Um, uh, one trend to uh, try to notice, or lack of a trend, I suppose, is, um, and it's somewhat hard to see because the z-axis is the log scale, but um, unlike the attenuation coefficients, which tend to trend positively with um, z, there's not as strong of a trend because this is taking into um, account cost. Now, um, that actually doesn't mean that some of our best materials aren't um, 
elements with high Z numbers, uh, which we will see in a second. Um, graphs like these essentially helped us pick the, uh, the, the winners and losers. So now we can uh, break down those uh, plots uh, and figures and show our uh, sweet winners in the tables. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this table, as I said, it, it has our uh, winners for each of the energy ranges and the three aerial densities that we evaluated at. Um, we must recall that only pure elements, water, concrete, and stainless steel were evaluated uh, for each of the, uh, or for shielding worth. Um, these uh, shielding worth calculations do not take into account um, poor elemental um, chemical properties. Uh, and some of these, uh, some of these elements uh, with these poor qualities are um, iron, which is corrosive. It uh, rusts from air exposure. That's not necessarily uh, an ideal or realistic shielding material. Also, pure barium, it's not found um, in its, uh, on its own in nature. Uh, and when pure barium is in possession, it oxidizes very easily. Uh, barium is found um, in nature in its oxide form. Also, carbon is not uh, an ideal shielding material because it has such a low atomic number. Thorium is a naturally uh, occurring radioisotope, and sulfur is highly flammable. All these um, attributes are negative qualities that would uh, hinder them from being used as uh, realistic, everyday shielding materials. Um, one thing to notice uh, is that in the 0 0.015 and the 0 0.02 MeV range, concrete uh, was the winners in all three of the aerial densities that we used. Um, and then water uh, was the winner for the three aerial densities in all of the upper energy ranges. <clears throat> this slide has the uh, best four uh, materials based on our sweet uh, metric in the 25 grams per centimeter squared uh, aerial density. So we have on the left-hand side table, it's all of our energies from 0.015 to 0.5 MeV. And then on this uh, table is from 0.6 to um, 15 uh, MeV. Again, you can see water in the upper energy ranges uh, is clearly the best, uh, best shielding material. And then concrete here is the, uh, the second best. We also, over in this range, we see a lot of times where lead, um, lead starts making appearances in the top two or three. Um, and then we will see lead again uh, later. <clears throat> and then uh, here is the same uh, table, but for the 100 gram per centimeter squared aerial density. In the uh, 0.015, or sorry, the 0 0.03 MeV to the 0.2 MeV energy ranges, we see barium and sulfur uh, clearly as the um, best shielding material. But as we discussed earlier, barium and sulfur are not realistic shielding materials. Uh, barium sulfate actually, we, we didn't check the cost of it, but barium sulfate actually is a uh, known uh, good shielding material and it has similar properties uh, to lead. Uh, and this final one has the aerial densities of 250 grams per centimeter squared. Uh, we can see in the upper energy ranges, again, water is the uh, uh, leading material. And then we see lead um, as the second best in the upper energy ranges. Uh, we also start seeing stainless steel um, in the, with the higher aerial densities. We see stainless steel uh, making more appearances um, as um, better shields. And then over in the lower energy ranges, for example, we've got <clears throat> um, the 0 0.02 MeV range all the way up to the 1 MeV. Uh, we can claim that lead is the optimum shielding material. Now at 0.2 MeV, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0 0.6 MeV, um, iron and thorium are listed as our sweet winners based on our shielding worth assessment. Um, but as we also discussed, iron and thorium are not necessarily ideal shielding materials in their pure elemental form. So uh, we, can, um, we can disregard those, uh, those ones and look to the second best, which is lead. So in the 0.2 MeV to 1 MeV range, uh, we have lead as our winner. 
So in conclusion, the sweetest materials are uh, somewhat unsurprisingly water, lead, and concrete. And I suppose this serves as kind of a verification of just typical uh, reactor building techniques because you know water is often a coolant or a moderator in a reactor, so you're getting the good shielding ability um, at the high incident uh, photon ranges. Uh, lead is just commonly associated, at least in, in our field, with um, shielding. And then concrete is a pretty typical building material in a reactor, um, so that all makes sense. Um, but it, it is good to know that we did find some materials that aren't as commonly used as shielding materials that could be, um, you know, perhaps implemented later on. Um, as Stephen said, it's important to consider the chemical properties of the material because numerically in our sweet score we didn't take that into account. Um, most notably, you know, barium and sulfur on their on their own have uh, you know chemical properties that aren't ideal, but combined barium sulfate is actually somewhat of a common um, shielding material. Um, in the future, this analysis could be applied to um, oxides, alloys, other types of stainless steel, hydrides, chlorides, etc. cetera. And um, uh, we've actually applied some of this to the naturally occurring oxide forms. And um, lead oxide and aluminum oxide are really good. They're actually the only two oxides we found that beat their elemental, like pure element counterparts. Um, the reason being is it's actually very hard to source elements at a cost low enough to overcome the sort of inherent reduction in the number density of the element of interest, um, which is somewhat interesting. Perhaps there's just not the, um, the, per the supply chain set up uh, for, for shielding with those materials. Um, and then um, otherwise, we, we would like to look at chlorides, but um, you know, that, that's to come. And we're hoping to, to uh, put this in as a uh, a peer-reviewed published paper soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some questions? Questions? That was a really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so, so a lot of it's all discussions on on gamma ray shielding. Right. And um, and I and I noticed your your major he metrics had to do with uh, cost, density, and linear attenuation. Or, right. yeah. So combined, it's kind of like the mass attenuation coefficient divided by cost. Um, when you look at some of your leading candidates, going, you know, I saw that you kind of evolved from water, uh, all the way to more exotic things like thorium. Um, which one of those provides the best volume savings? So you, you talk about reducing mass or improving attenuation for this for the right. same mass, but which one actually gives you the best volume uh, decrease? So I, c I couldn't actually give you a specific material, but the reason, so I at least in our sweet analysis, if instead of dividing by the density, we multiplied by the density, that would actually find materials where you're not, um, you're not as interested in um, lightweight masses. And that's another reason why we did aerial densities instead of just looking at sh constant shield thicknesses, because it sort of normalizes by the material's density. Um, since our motivation initially was um, perhaps for space shielding, we cared more about the mass, uh, you know, like getting the best shielding worth per mass rather than um, a, a thickness. But perhaps if we were, if our motivation had been um, nuclear batteries or micro reactors, you know, that respond in a case of an emergency where you, you need to just quit, uh, something that can fit on the back of a, you know, a semi uh, or a trailer bed essentially, then, then it, we probably would have come up with a, a different. Uh, analytical model, essentially, um, that cared more about volume than than, than uh, mass. But I, I, I could I don't want to just like be like oh probably you know lead or what. But because I, I honestly don't know. That's a great question. Another question? Yes. I'm going to ask you the second half of that question. So now you are working on a micro reactor. You are working on a reactor that's going to go on a semi truck, and you need to work with a materials engineer to combine your best shielding with the best way to make it light shielding, lightweight. What would you do? Um, Where would you go you, with your project at the next level? If you're not getting well, even if you take it up to space, like you said, lightweight is better than heavyweight. So how you would you approach that? Do you want to answer? 
So obviously, once you start getting into actually building these shields, I mean, this is purely theoretical, and, and like we said, we, we, we really would have liked to have found a way to like numerically or, quantita or yeah, quantitatively assess the chemical, uh, the more practical capabilities. Um, more practically, we'd probably want to get with the materials engineer um, you know, once we start building it, but in reality, um, these are you know, either concrete, water, stainless steel, or pure element shields. That, that's actually, I mean, th this is all theoretical. In reality, we'd probably want like a multi-layered shield, um, something, you know, I'm just sort of making this up, like, uh, you know, uranium and then like copper on either edge to, you know, to block um, what, exactly, right. exactly. See, maybe I'm not just purely making it up, but <laughs> 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 thank you. Um, so, yes, if we were actually wanting to do this, we definitely would need a materials engineer, but I feel like there'd be quite a few steps before then um, just so that our, our theoretical analysis at least is more practical. Um, yeah, that's my best answer. Do we have a question? Do we go one more? One more. I think what's, what's interesting about your conclusions, and maybe, again, you, you've already said, probably not a big surprise, but think about light water reactors all have kind of relied on water and concrete in particular. Um, as part of their safety case. Advanced reactors don't necessarily have those. And um, I think what you know, new reactor designers are finding is that they have to add these traditional shielding uh, materials um, you know, where back with the older reactors, it's, it's kind of been a given. You know? yeah. So they're playing very specific roles as shielding um, as opposed to, say, a coolant or a pressure boundary or something like that. Um, it's a, probably an added cost that people didn't really think of uh, when they started dreaming up the advanced reactors, but it's yes. important. Cool. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank you again. Thank you. I think that went pretty well. We will get group number five, and after that, we will take a little break. <laughs> By the way, it is my honor that the company with Eric Giovatoni that provides Microsoft yeah, like this, 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 this software, he was my student. <laughs> he, was, he was my student. <laughs> yeah, he's your boss. He was your boss. And, and he was my student. Yeah. So his son is here now in the in, in the state. and he was taking a course in the fall, and I ha he came to greet me. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> and she was my student too. <laughs> I'm, I'm so proud of her. And the Tanya, Tanya also. Yeah, just like right here. Yeah, she made the senior VP. She was my boss. Daniel. Daniel Hamilton was. She didn't know you. How lovely. Okay, guys, all right. Please start. Go ahead and introduce yourself, your advisors, and your industry. All right, hello. 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 So we're going to be presenting today on the application of tuning forks in measuring density and viscosity of molten salt systems. Um, our group, which we have dubbed the Salt Pack, um, comprises of me, Ryan, Harrison, Madison, and Declan. Um, our advisor is Dr. Alexander Bataler, and our sponsor from Copenhagen Atomics is Aslax Stubbisgard. I apologize if I butchered that last name. So a little introduction as to what we're doing. We ultimately want to measure the density and viscosity of a molten salt system by monitoring in the immersed tuning fork. And we're going to try to look for those changes in the, the resonance frequency. And, and by measuring that, we can kind of estimate what those changes of viscosity and density are. Um, and similar systems have been actually employed and more or less have there have been proof of concepts that you can do this. Um, and that's largely what our design is going to be based off of. Um, and the real focus of our experiment that differs us from those 
is that we want to apply it to a multi-cell system. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, given our audience. Um, I, I imagine most of you know what MSRs are. Um, but uh, the primary points that are important to our experiment is that they use melted salts as their primary coolant. Um, they operate at low pressures and much higher temperatures than you would expect in a typical PWR, BWR. Um, and important for our case is that salts can be corrosive, which we've obviously seen with experimental reactors in the past. Okay, so the goals of our experiment is to design and build a device for measuring the viscosity and density of a liquid using a tuning fork. And from that, we want to measure, well, we wanted to measure the damping effect caused by submerging the tuning fork in liquid. And the device must be able to withstand the high temperatures of molten salts and also develop a method for interpreting the frequency output of the tuning fork. So motivations, why are we doing this? Um, there's been a renewed interest in molten salt reactors, especially as we start looking at MSR, or, uh, excuse me, SMRs and uh, micro reactors. Um, it's a possible solution for having mobile reactors. We'll talk later with our sponsor. They're actually developing reactors that can be put on the, uh, on the back of a truck bed and moved from site to site, or at least the primary loop. Um, and with that requires new instrumentation that can survive in these systems and provide reliable output, um, whether it be first safety features, just active live monitoring. Um, and ultimately, we want to make our system as cost efficient as possible. Um, we want to make sure that you can use this, measure your, your molten salt sample while it's online um, without damaging your instrumentation, obviously. So for the tuning fork that we used, um, originally we had planned on machining our own tuning fork. Uh, we had used SolidWorks frequency analysis uh, to allow us to characterize the tuning fork. We found that the tuning fork that we had modeled would have an expected frequency of about 475 hertz. Uh, that can be changed by altering the geometry. And if we were to move forward with this machine tuning fork, we would try to get it closer to 440 hertz because it's a more standard uh, resonant frequency. Uh, in this machine tuning fork, we would electroplate it for corrosion resistance, and our potential material would be stainless steel 410 or 416. The reason we're using 400 class stainless steel is because they are magnetic, um, and our design system relies on a magnetic impulse to activate the tuning fork, and so the 400 class is really the only class of stainless steels that will survive in a temperature of molten salts and also remain magnetic. Um, and so, like, as I mentioned, it needs to be magnetic and heat resistant, and electroplating is for, contr for corrosion resistance. Um, to save ourselves some time and money, we purchased a 440 hertz tuning fork. Um, we designed a 3D model of a mount for the tuning fork and a silicon dioxide tube. Uh, this was mostly just because the silicon dioxide was what we had on hand. Um, we we're thinking about using other materials for it too, but due to time constraints, we really only were able to use uh, the quartz tube. So we machined the mount out of stainless steel. This was to control the heat that, uh, or the, the intended effect was to um, control the heat output onto an optical bench that we were using for our experimental setup. We just wanted to mitigate heat transfer, um, and stainless steel pres provided enough heat resistance that it shouldn't have been a problem. Um, we attempted to bond the parts with an Aramco ceramic adhesive, but uh, in the curing process, our uh, quartz tube broke, um, and unfortunately, it would take too long to repair it. So instead, we bonded, a, we bonded the tube using silicone for low temperature measurements, um, but as we'll talk about, that didn't quite work out either. All right, so our complete setup features two main electrical systems. The first uh, is relevant to inducing the vibration of the tuning fork and measuring that vibration. That's the setup here. It features an electromagnet, which will have, um, I'll explain that in the next slide actually, but that's approximately how it looks. And the other electrical system is the heater system, which is what we'd use to melt the molten salt, um, which is of course the primary focus of this LEC, practical application focus of this uh, experiment. As for the electromagnet, which is essentially this is the top um, electrical system from the previous um, slide, so essentially this right here. What we have here is a horseshoe electromagnet, which um, will perform a frequency sweep from, say, 100 hertz to 1,000 hertz, for example. And this 
electromagnet will induce a vibration in this tuning fork, as the tuning fork is also magnetic, which um, will then be measured by this pickup. And essentially, what we're looking for is if, um, with the frequency sweep, when we hit that uh, resonant frequency of the tuning fork, it'll resonate more intensely, obviously, and the pickup will have a larger induced voltage, and we should be able to measure that. And of course, this uh, resonant frequency of the tuning fork should depend on the medium. We're looking for 440 hertz in air resonance, but in, say, water or a molten salt, we'll have some other resonance, and um, we'll measure that using the pickup, and we'll relate that back to the density and the viscosity using some equations that we'll calibrate towards, which we'll discuss in a future slide. So for the heating element, we ended up using an uh, alumina ceramic and wrapping nichrome wire around it. And when I say we, I made Declan and Harrison do it, and then I stole it for the fun stuff. Um, and we then insulated with a, uh, with a fiber cloth um, so that way we could really direct that heat towards our, our system, um, our liquid. Um, actually, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. I'll like to go back a slide. Uh, we, we actually power the heater with a, uh, with a Bariac transformer up that can go up to 140 volts input. Um, and you will see that in the picture that is coming up. Yeah. So in terms of theory and equations, we borrowed these equations from um, another paper. And really, there's a ton of stuff that goes into this. We'll need to characterize what our voltage outputs mean in terms of the frequency and, and the uh, quality factor. But ultimately, these are the two most important equations here. The, the omega naught is going to be our resonant frequency, and Q is going to be our uh, quality factor. And all those other weird variables, I don't know how they name them, but those are going to be our uh, calibration parameters. So what we'll do is once we've designed our system and, and it's spreading its, in its correct geometry, we'll use six different calibration fluids to solve for those parameters. And once those parameters have been solved for with that specific geometry, we can throw in a fluid and based off of the frequency and quality factor that we get out, we can find our viscosity and density, as you can see in these equations. So we just get a massive system of equations, more or less, um, coupled with whatever equations we need to end up using to solve for our voltages um, to solve for that viscosity and density. So the calibration fluids that we had chosen, but we did not unfortunately get to use yet, um, we ended up actually using Valvoline motor oil. Um, and that's just because apparently Valvoline is one of the only motor oil companies that puts out their viscosity and density, at least in a way that we can use. Um, so, and then obviously at the very end, our goal is to use uh, molten sodium nitrate. We chose sodium nitrate because it's not very corrosive and it's not very expensive um, as our proof of concept. All right. So um, how this actually works is our electromagnet, the input voltage for our frequency sweep comes from a lock and amplifier. And essentially, this is the code we used. Um, one of the research assistants with Dr. Rattaler developed it for us, which was not ex exclusively for us, but he let us use his code, which is really nice. Very simple. We basically, for our purposes, you just set a minimum frequency and a maximum frequency. So the example I gave was 100 to 1,000, could be 100 to 500, whatever, and you just run it. And um, yeah, the pickup also loops into the lock and amplifier because it uh, both provides a input frequency and also measures and interprets the output voltage from the pickup. And so our results were a bit unexpected, to say the least. What we were expecting to see is essentially just some noise, very low signal up until the peak of interest. So for our first measurement, which was in air, you can see our setup right there, um, we expected to see basically nothing up until 440 and then a huge peak. But instead, we saw this uh, very broad peak at some seemingly unimportant uh, frequency. And we were pondering what the issue could be. Um, we thought maybe there's too much noise in the system, or the electromagnetic coupling isn't very well, or maybe the pickup's just measuring the electromagnet itself, and the tuning fork isn't vibrating, or something like that. So we did a lot of troubleshooting for this experiment. And um, what we did find out was we took this whole thing apart, because it wasn't working. And right now, the tuning fork is in some kind of pedestal. It's kind of hard to see with that picture. But uh, we tried to physically resonate it, and it would not resonate. Don't know why. It's something to do with the bonding to the pedestal. So we took it out, and basically, it's like clamped there with a pretty tight clamp. And maybe that also dampens the signal a bit. But it was better, because we did physically test that with the clamp. It did resonate physically. So we did the same thing with the um, setup right there. And it certainly did change the output, because what this is is frequency and then amplitude, which is just the magnitude of the 
induced voltage in the pickup. And you can see the, it characteristically changes, but it's still a very broad peak. Um, maybe there's signal in there in terms of uh, 440 is what we're looking for, but it might still just be the pickup measuring the electromagnet itself and the tuning fork providing very minimal um, contribution to that. Um, we did further troubleshooting. <laughs> yeah, so just to um, calibrate our system and make sure that we actually understood what we were working with, uh, we removed the tuning fork from the equation and just tried to monitor or to measure the characteristic frequency of our electromagnetic circuit. Um, so we performed a frequency sweep with just the driver and pickup magnets from, I believe it's like 100 hertz to 50,000 hertz. And what we found was across all the different capacitors that we tested, because we believed that there could be an issue with the inductance of the circuit, so we tried different capacitors. Across all the capacitors that we tested, uh, we noticed a very well characterized peak at 23,000 hertz. Um, and this was mostly just to make sure that we weren't having a second peak at 440 hertz that could alter our results or mess them up. Um, so this was just characterizing our circuit. So here's the fun stuff I got to do with the heater. Um, we, for this particular iteration, I wanted to characterize the axial temperature distribution of the inner shell of our <coughs> alumina heater. Um, so there's no liquid in this particular iteration. And what I did is I ramped the variac all the way up to 100% power output, 140 volts. And I ended up using a J-type thermocouple to kind of probe up and down the, um, the heater element right here. And I can kind of point to that right here on the inside. Um, and ultimately, I took six radial measurements at each axial point, And this was eyeballed, hence the, the horizontal error bars there. Um, and those just, just kind of like measure that, that temperature distribution. And the reason we want to do this, you can see so far, we're really only accounting for the geometry of the tuning fork as impacting that resonant frequency. And obviously, that, that's not really a true case. So we need to see, is there going to be a different temperature distribution along that height? Is that temperature going to induce flow in our system? Obviously, we're trying to run a static system. So it looks OK here. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and this, this is the setup for the next bit, where we actually got to melt salt in, in the uh, heater. Um, and you can see we have it mounted to a ring stand right here. You can see the melted salt in here. And we have a, the J-type thermocouple. Um, same concept. We're looking for the axial temperature distribution. Um, and, but this time, we have it dipped in the center of the liquid. Um, and we have, you can see the heater. You can see how it, uh, it decided to change colors on us once it got hot. Uh, the variac. And we had a wire set to ground for safety purposes. So this plot looks much more promising. Um, we were able to get the temperature up to a melting point. In fact, I accidentally boiled it, which is why we did it in a fume hood. Um, but you can see, compared to the last plot that I showed you, it really, we're only showing a difference in about 20 degrees Celsius, so a much tighter temperature distribution. So there'll probably still be some induced flow once we get this system up and running. But it is much better than that first plot showed. And the reason here I only go about half the height of the heater is because, like I said, it boiled. Um, but the air, I'm assuming the air cooling on the top actually kept the salt on top solid. So I didn't know it had melted and boiled. So we lost about half of that volume. So for our market evaluation, we're going to look at the anticipated market, experimental costs, anticipated industry costs and anticipated points of profits. It's important to note here that since we're largely doing an experiment, um, a lot of this is kind of roundabout guessing, trying to consider things that we would need to do to actually implement this in an industrial process. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Yeah, so um, we, found a market we found a market research survey that estimated that the molten salt reactor market is expected to reach uh, $36.81 billion by 2029. Our industrial sponsor, Copenhagen Atomics, expects to have a one megawatt thermal demo reactor by 2025 and have a 100 megawatt thermal thorium-based molten salt reactor online by 2028. So we're seeing some promising growth in the market. But it's still largely theoretical because they aren't out yet. <laughs> so this is more or less the cost of our experiment thus far. And you can see they're color coded. Um, red is the most expensive. Um, really, the most expensive cost would be a lock-in amplifier or whatever measurement 
system, your, your device that you're using to actually see the output. Um, luckily, our advisor, Dr. Bataler, is kind of a, a physics geek, so he already had a lock-in amplifier for us to use, so we actually didn't have to pay that cost. So the actual system itself is relatively low cost. I think most of the costs are going to come up, come from uh, actually implementing it, building your potentially a bypass to actually measure on the reactor where your, your uh, tuning fork is going to be inserted. Okay. Well, for the anticipated industry cost, um, like I said, for the uh, for the valves, um, we're gonna ha we assumed that we would need a wide globe valve and a gate valve. Um, and the reason we chose those particular valves is we're gonna need a way for the actual main coolant to flow into our measurement system and flow out. But we'll also need a little test valve so that way we can one once we have it set up, put those calibration fluids in there and measure it, like get get everything all set up, and then obviously if you need to do any kind of maintenance on the system. Um, we assumed that we would need to pay for at least an electrician and a mechanical engineer, and I have down here health physicists as well. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Zeno, I should have included a, a crit safety analysis would probably need to be done as well because we're, we're obviously putting stuff in our, in our field. Um, but like, like I said, this is largely, it's all approximate um, until we have an actual operating molten salt reactor again, especially if we're going to be switching to SMRs. Um, the prices are really, really guessing the best that we can until we have those prices, those models. Okay, so to continue the market evaluation, we focused on the anticipated points of profit. So if we were actually installing this tuning fork, we could make a profit, profit from that installation process. And also there can be a profit from maintenance and repairs because as time occurs, corrosion and wear and tear to the tuning fork will occur and therefore that will result in you know, another replacement of a tuning fork. And also, as time occurs, potential radiation effects on the material will occur. So, maintenance and repairs would be needed. And also, if we had software, we could make a profit just from the data and the measurements. So, we could sell those measurements. And it's actually a good benefit to customers because it's a reliable online monitoring of fluid properties that can be seen. And if needed, people could, you know, create this and install this to more than one system. And this system has a potential to be used as a trigger or sensor for safety systems. And in summary, the market for molten salt reactors are expected to rise over the next 10 years. Um, experimental costs were kept really low, and that was also due to the fact that we already had available equipment that was accessible to us. And compared to other reactor systems, the cost of our instrument can be kept really low as well. And multiple profit opportunities to the sellers. And there's also, you know, good benefits to the, cons to the customer, as I mentioned in the last slide. So in terms of future work, obviously we're going to need to redesign our tuning fork apparatus, especially those, those EM components. Um, we need to be able to see that resonant peak if we're going to go forward. Um, so in part of that, we want to kind of cl uh, clean up that EM coupling. We think that possibly our mounts, since they were all steel mounts, that could also be adding some interference, um, which also goes into the noise reduction. And ultimately, we want to get to that proof of concept. We want to run an experiment with our calibration fluids, prove that we can melt molten salt and we can measure the viscosity and density with our system. And really for potentially future groups, we'd really like to, to start accounting for other factors that could change that viscosity and density and move that resonance peak, uh, whether it be by induced flow, if we had say like a salt pump, and we could actually pretend that we have, or not pretend, actually flow salt over our tuning fork, see how that impacts our system and compares to a static system. Um, plenty, of, plenty of opportunities for future work here. And we want to thank, obviously, Dr. Bataler for mentoring us on this um, and his student, Justin Overman, uh, for preparing that LabVIEW software for us. None of us are comp sci people, so we really appreciated that. Um, and we thank uh, Aslak Subscar from Cop Copenhagen Atomics. Um, he was, he's been really helpful in, in mentoring us along the way, trying to troubleshoot some of those issues with the tuning fork as well. And obviously, thanks to the Department of Nuclear Engineering for the logistical support. And this is just a little, again, a shout out to Copenhagen Atomics. Some of the stuff that they're doing is pretty unique. 
they're trying to create that primary salt loop, create that heat source for a reactor, and they can put it on the back of a truck bed, move it wherever they want, as well as some other interesting projects that they have going on. And you can see their stuff at copenhagenatomics.com. So obviously any questions, but this is an ongoing experiment, of course, so any feedback as well as we, as we prepare our final report and pass it on to the next group would be uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. comments and ask you to talk to me afterwards because I've spent a little bit of time working on this and I know the folks from Copenhagen Atomics. I don't know if somebody loves you or somebody hates you gave you that project. It's a very consequential project. It is very difficult, very complicated, but I love it. And here's why. Uh, you're trying to actually, I would have called this acoustic methodology to measure uh, salt, uh, salt uh, characteristics. Going back, although I was going to tell you one thing, uh, don't change the, the tuning fork. You're going to be changing it every day if that's what you're going to do. You need to figure out to get it to a, a corrosion film that sits on it and use it with that film on it. And don't change it every day. If you want to talk about that, let's talk about that separate from this. And then the other item, and I'm going to stop. You never said which salt you're working on. So you need to characterize some salt, tell us which one, because they're not all the same. It's fluoride-based, chloride-based. Those mostly were salts, uh, the type of two salts that basically are, they're focused on. And the last thing I'm gonna tell you is that uh, you said that it's in the future, salts are not, they're not. Keros is actually, and other companies, they're using uh, fluoride salt as a coolant. Uh, Terra Power is using, and we're building one of their reactors, The Molten chloride reactor experiment, the McCree at INL, and it is uh, it's a fast reactor, uh, chloride based. So it's not theoretical, it's around the corner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a question? I shot really, really quick. I, I appreciate the points you made. If you want to go back a couple of slides to just the tuning fork, uh, the corrosion resistance won't go forward. Yeah. Uh, we actually intentionally negated looking at a corrosion resistant film. Uh, because for our purposes, we thought it would be okay, but water actually got us, and so that's going to also adjust our. Um, we need to keep yeah. water and humidity away from this entire system. Absolutely right. We found that out the hard way. <laughs> but, but I'm going to tell you one more thing. You said that when you uh, tried to bond the system with the clamps and so on, you had a problem. This doesn't work. Sorry for saying that, because the more stress you put on the system, the more impact you have on the traveling uh, that acoustic uh, signal through it. One of the measures, ways to measure tensile properties of metal is actually the speed of sound through it. So I'm telling you, you're, you're varying something that actually cannot be made static, and you try to measure a static quality. So that's going to be difficult. I wouldn't For try sure. that. Okay. Let us see if there are any other questions for this group. Yeah, yeah, we we absolutely appreciate that. I kind of, mm -hmm. I almost wish I had three years to work on this yes. project because it, yeah, yeah, yeah.
still have the page component in it. So it's not really helping um, on that particular part, but at least try to be more with uh, Silicon Web in that case. You might come with a variety of the viscosity that already created. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, it really can be applied to any system that has a fluid running through it. We didn't really look into it at all, but there's also a possibility for um, for maybe even gaseous systems, probably not as much because obviously they're going to be compressible. But yeah, it could absolutely be applied to plenty of different fields, um, even in existing PWRs and BWRs, if you can protect it against water, like they've been talking about. But um, yeah, for sure, absolutely.
Uh, I'm Victor Gonzalez. Uh, I'm Patrick Walter. I'm Cameron Wagner. Um, and we are the GE Hitachi Group. Uh, we're doing a neutronics analysis of advanced reactor vessel uh, emissivity. Our NC State advisor is Dr. Wu. Um, our GEH advisors are Dr. Zeno in the back over there, uh, Dr. Eric Lowen, and Zachary Sweeney, who's been our point of contact for the entire year. Um, first, I wanted to go over um, the reactor that we're going to be studying. Uh, it's called PRISM. It's a generation four sodium cooled fast reactor with uh, output of 345 megawatts electric. Um, its core is surrounded by a 316 stainless steel pressure vessel and a 387 stainless steel guard vessel uh, with an argon gas spacer in between uh, the pressure vessel and the guard vessel. Um, it's cooled via a passive system called the Reactor Vessel Auxiliary Cooling System, otherwise known as RVAX, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide, and uh, it plans to use HALU fuel. So RVAX is a safety grade passive decay heat removal system that utilizes radi radiative and convective heat transfer. Uh, RVAX is driven by natural circulation that uses air um, as the heat sink to remove heat from the reactor vessels. Uh, so its primary function is to assist in reactor decay heat removal after the reactor is shut down. Um, and then that removal of decay heat will ensure the protection of the core and the surrounding concrete, which is extremely important. So um, I also wanted to highlight that heat transfer in the system is gonna flow from the sodium pool to the pressure vessel via conduction and convection. From there, um, through the argon gap spacer, uh, the path continues from the pressure vessel to the guard vessel via radiation. And then after that, it's gonna go from the air riser um, via the same mode and convection uh, or from the guard vessel to uh, collect the cylinder via radiation. So our first project goal was to identify the pressure vessel and guard vessel emissivity as well as different methods to increase this emissivity value. And we also were going to simulate um, expected radiation influence over a 60 year lifetime for these um, steels and their uh, treatments. And we also wanted to contrast their different economic impact per enhancement options. So radi radiative heat transfer is largely dependent on emissivity. And emissivity is really a measure of how well a material can emit thermal energy. And it ranges in value from zero to one. So GE Itachi gave us a design requirement of 0 0.7. And the two different steels we're looking at, 316 and 387, are relatively low on that spectrum at around 0 0.2 to 0 0.35. And standard methods of increasing this include oxidation and uh, surface roughening but this only brings it up to 0 0.4 or 0 0.6. So we looked at other options such as the Remco uh, high A40M coating or nickel plasma nitriding. And both of these produce emissivity values that are in excess of the necessary requ requirements by GE Hitachi. And we also identified these enhancement options through uh, academic literature. So for the first coding, the Aramco coding, uh, we looked at both the vendor information and academic literature to identify a 30 micron thickness that is necessary to create the emissivity we're looking for. And we also found key constituents, inorganic constituents of this coding, but due to this being a uh, proprietary information, we weren't able to find specific balances between them. So we are looking at each individually and trying to determine a limiting factor amongst these uh, constituents. So as for the nitriding, um, the nitriding uh, plasma nickel, or the nickel plasma nitriding treatment, um, there's a layer of nickel that's deposited onto the steel in this situation. Um, so on our graph here, uh, the outline shapes are going to be experimental results while the solid shapes are uh, computational expectations. So uh, we actually were unable to find exactly for 316 for this plasma nitriding treatment, but we found literature that said that this could be done and could be done on an industrial scale. 
From there, we decided to find something that would be comparable um, to 316, and we identified um, that as 600. Um, and it's justified for our application since they have similar corrosive properties um, due to the amount of chromium in the stainless steel. And the reactor will not be operating at a temperature where that 316 or 387, which has an even higher melt temperature, will melt, um, achieving our desired emissivity values. Yeah, so we made an MCMP model of the system. We've got a homogeneous core mixture in place of the core, which is created using equivalent amounts of ur uranium, sodium, and zirconium known as a low density smear over where the core would be to produce the neutron flux, since we're not particularly interested in what's going on in the core. We're looking at the effects on the emissivity enha enhancements, and those are modeled as thin layers on the outside of the 316 pressure vessel, and then on the inside and outside of the 387 guard vessel. And then a volume cylindrical source is overlaid over the region in the center, which produces the neutron flux. And then we have the outputs. We have the fluxes within each different region of coating for each of the four major inorganic constituents as well as the plasma nitriding. And as you <coughs> see, there's very little fluctuation between each of the coating materials, and that's likely due to low cross sections as well as um, very thin um, coatings compared to the attenuation that we're going to be seeing from the guard vessel and pressure vessel. And then the relative error um, for each case was seen to be very, very low. So. <coughs> and then for more model validation, we were looking at the flux energy distribution within the most, the innermost coating, which is the pressure vessel coating. And we see that I've been them in the thermal, epithermal, and fast flux energy bins um, given, with, given in the, um, the table. And as you see, we find predominantly fast flux with some epithermal flux and very small amount of thermal flux, which would be expected of a fast flux system like we have in this reactor. And then in terms of the neutron loss methods, these, these were consistent throughout pretty much all of the test cases. We find that most of them come from fissions and weight cutoff with a very small amount from these end x in reactions. They were below or on the order of 700 running 5 million test particles. So very minimal. And the weight cutoff, just um, if you're not familiar with MCMP, after it scatters down enough, the weight of the particle is decreased. And they're cut off with a roulette that decides whether or not to keep the particle and increase the weight or just remove the particle from the system. So most of them scatter down to this low weight and are not removed from absorptions or uh, reactions with the coating materials is essentially what we found. So um, obviously one of our big goals was to uh, discuss the economic impact of the system. So I spent a good portion of the spring semester gathering uh, budgetary estimates from suppliers for stainless steels along with uh, contacting Aremco, whose coating we used, as a, along with um, another company, IBC Coatings, for that plasma nitriding uh, budgetary estimate. I was then able to compile all the economic data into a database and then ran the MATLAB code um, to find pricing for the two options. Uh, I do want to note here that these pricings are for the optimal um, coating thickness. Um, we did run uh, MCMP calculations as well at two and five and ten times uh, thickness. So for that 30 micron thickness for the Remco coating, as well as the 150 micron thickness for the plasma nitriding. Um, so as you can see, the Remco coating is much cheaper when you uh, compile all the data and calculate what the cost will be to implement this uh, along with the stainless steels as compared to the nitriding. Um, that significant cost difference is mainly attributed to the fact that for plasma nitriding, um, many of the systems that are being used, especially at IBC coatings, uh, are for very small sheets and are not for uh, large scale reactors. This system is 10,000 square feet. Um, so basically what would have to happen is they would need to build a custom uh, chamber for us to use. Um, and that's where the majority of the cost here would come from. So if we look at the different data we found, as well as looking at the different uh, thicknesses we use with the two times, the five times, and even comparing to a case where we ran, where there was no coding, you don't see a large effect upon 
the coding by neutrons or gamma rays. So this m means that these coding, the Aramco coding, is viable for uh, a 60 year lifetime. As well as what uh, Patrick went over, the cost is very economical compared to other <laughs> in a test reactor to, uh, to actually see what happens to these coatings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you were to back that out, so if you go back here, uh, it's about $3.8 million in total. So you would take about two to two and a half million dollars off of it if you were to already have that system set up. But still, that obviously, you're talking in order of magnitude difference here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Um, I'm not a metal uh, you know, guy, but would nitriding affect the strength of steel? Um, that was something that uh, we performed a literature review first semester. Uh, that was something that came up, um, but it definitely was something that was not that large enough of a knock against it, considering the other options that we showcased didn't really meet the design requirements. Um, so we were looking for something that really met that emissivity requirement. Um, but that would definitely be something that, when this project goes further, uh, would need to be examined. Go ahead, find it, dude. Might scroll a little bit. Oh, there's no scroll. Oh. There we go. Okay. Full uh, screen. Slideshow. Oh. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Trayvon Griffin, and these are my group mates. Joseph. Henry Osborne. Alexandra Aikens. And I'm Cooper Trucks. Okay, and this is our uh, experiment on designing a low pressure heated subcapsule. Um, we will create a environment similar like to a reactor to test the subcapsule and see how our various parameters will work out. And your advisor? Oh, my apologies. Um, our advisors. Dr. Yang and our uh, industry advisor is Joe Palmer from the Idaho National Laboratory. Okay, so the old traditional sensors are not working anymore. They're failing in reactors and causing readings to not show accurately. So a new technology has been discovered uh, and worked on uh, the fiber optic pressure sensors and our project is going to test those sensors we're gonna create a, a mock environment like a reactor to test the sensors to see how much better they are compared to the traditional sensors. Um, we will test uh, to make sure that the temperature, neutron flux, and pressure read accurately. Okay, so to attain the goal of proving that these sensors are better than the traditional sensors, we have three objectives that we have to achieve. The first being uh, obtaining a temperature of 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. The second would be 
figuring out how far away our subcapsule housing unit, which houses the pressure sensor, should be away from the core. And uh, a group mate Cooper will talk about that and how he used OpenMC to determine that placement. And the last would just to be to prove that uh, the sensor, when it's away from the core and closer to the core, read the same amount uh, accurately. Okay, so within our housing unit, we have like a small gap, which we would typically use neon to fill up, but neon is a little bit too expensive and we don't have that in budget. So we'll use um, helium and argon, which are very similar to neon, and we'll check out the different concentrations of ne helium and argon within the system at 100% helium, 100% argon, and a mixture concentration of both. So here on the far side of the screen, you can see the housing unit that we used. It's made of stainless steel. And what we did, we had a custom-made um, coiled heater that you can see in yellow right here. And that's what simulated our reactor environment. So that red block that you see on the screen is our heater sleeve. And we use that to maintain a two millimeter gas gap between the inner diameter of the housing unit and the outer diameter of the sleeve. And what that did, it allowed us to maintain conductive heat transfer within the small gap right there. And that gap was filled with helium and argon, which we varied the concentrations in that mock to neon as well. And we used a type K thermocouple and we did include a small threaded hole in the side to possibly incorporate an optical fiber-based pressure sensor, but we unfortunately did not end up to using that. And a small ceramic sphere in the bottom just helps insulate everything. So these are the, this is a close zoom in of what the housing unit actually looks like. You can see on your far left, that's a Konax fitting that helped maintain a, a leak proof environment near the top of the housing unit. Um, one issue we ran into in the center, as you can see the spring here, it was a bit too large at first, so we had to get some machining work done. Um, the, ha the unit came in three pieces. We f found that was easiest to actually compress the heater and fit it into the housing unit. And on the far right, you can see the housing unit in its entirety with the gas line being at a 90 degree angle. We used the type K thermocouple and then we the heater wires which were attached to a 50 volt power supply. So this is our piping and instrumentation diagram. Um, you can see I referred to the pressure sensors as primary and secondary, the primary being the one that read the gas first. There's a small distance um, between the two pressure sensors. If we were to do this again, we would make it a bit larger of a distance. Um, one other issue we ran into, as you can see, we have some needle valves and mass flow meters. We were going to get some proper mass flow controllers, but unfortunately the um, lead times on those are fairly long. So what we did end up doing was um, just using the needle valves instead, but that kind of screwed up some of our results because the needle valves, the flow coefficient was a bit too high. So when we used, we, we wanted to do a 50-50 helium argon mix. We weren't exactly sure how 50-50 it was, but we'll talk about that after the results are presented. And then this is just our testing setup in its entirety. Um, you can see the helium is the brown bottle, the argon is the blue bottle. Um, helium was introduced into the system first and argon was then slowly introduced afterwards and the entire system was held together with standard laboratory clamps. Yes, so we needed to calculate a temperature distribution in order to have something to compare our experimental results to. And um, there are two very crucial approximations that we made in order to reach, reach this temperature distribution. The first was that the temperature change across the housing unit wall and the heater sleeve is actually negligible due to very like relatively large um, thermal conductivities. The second is that the gas gap is actually too small for um, connect convective heat transfer to occur, so it's only conductive. And uh, because of these approximations, we were able to come up with an expression to relate this, which is um, at every thermocouple location, which is uh, T of T is equal to the surface temperature plus the change in the gap temperature. 
And the results of this uh, temperature distribution that we calculated are below, and this uh, is the temperature at each argon concentration. So uh, we also performed an open MC analysis. Uh, the primary goal of the analysis was to determine the position where we should place our experiment above the ATR core. Um, some secondary objectives uh, would be to determine if stainless steel is the right uh, material for the gamma heater. Um, and we are interested in finding the position where 30 watts of heating are generated in the gamma heater, shown in red. <coughs> Essentially, gamma heating works uh, when gamma rays interact with the material. Um, the general correlation is the denser the material, the more heating there will be. Um, so for the open MC problem, um, we need to configure the source, the geometry, and the uh, materials. So in the analysis setup, we used a cobalt-60 source in the shape of a fuel annulus around a flux trap in the ATR core. Um, the source was calibrated to match the exposure field above the ATR core, um, and I'll discuss that in the next slide as well. Uh, the geometry includes the heater in red, the experiment capsule, uh, the gas caps, and the guide tube. Um, and most of our materials are stainless steel. Um, in the model, the gas gap is air. It's a really low density, uh, given it's a gas, so it shouldn't matter too much um, what the material would be, and blue is water. Next slide. So here's the source validation that we performed. Um, on the right is a figure showing the uh, log of the gamma field above the ATR core. Uh, it's generated from a model of the ATR core. Um, and this is what I used as a reference to calibrate our own source. Uh, on the left is our source exposure test. It was calibrated at um, right in the center of the source. And from there, um, we increased the position by 30 centimeters um, up until around 1.8 meters. Uh, that's where the simulation stopped giving results um, based on the number of particles. Uh, so we're really interested in the distance between zero and one meters above the core. Um, that's where uh, Joe was expecting us to place it somewhere in there. So as you can see, um, calibrated at 9.5, um, up until 90 centimeters, it matches up pretty well um, with the provided figure. Um, and past that, um, the results drop off a bit, um, but I would go out on a limb to say that just because um, this is a single source and the ITR is much wider than that. Um, either way, doesn't really matter. Next slide. Yes, so these are our actual results. And here on the left is the comparison by temperature and by argon concentration for our actual experimental values and then the values that we calculated, like I talked about earlier. So we have some good results um, in general, but for the percentage of 0% ar uh, argon but 100% um, helium, we have a percent difference um, between the two values of about 28%, which is relatively high. And then for the half and half mixture, 50% argon, 50% helium, we have a percent difference of 1.22%, which is good, but like Henry mentioned earlier, it's difficult to verify if this is ex exactly 50% one gas versus the other. So for our 100% argon, we had a percent difference of 4.7%, which is also a good result. And then over here on the right, we have a um, comparison of two different uh, pressure sensors along the gas line. And the purpose of why we included this is to make sure that the results are saying the same thing along, the pressure results are saying the same thing along the gas line. And as you can see, they have very good agreement, which means that our results are reliable. And um, yes. Right. So here's the results from our shielding analysis. Um, so the ultimate result is we obtained our 30 watts of heating, um, which Again, it's uh, what the heating of our experiment that we performed, um, and it's also the heating of our thermal calculation. Uh, we determined that position was at 22.2 uh, centimeters above the core um, from the bottom of the experiment. Um, so here's the entire figure from zero to one meter. Um, you know, there's a lot of heating right when it's in the middle of the source, drops off considerably. Um, and in the zoomed in region, um, you can see uh, we were able to locate the position 22.2 centimeters. Um, uh, 
ultimately before Joe expected us to have a position around 10 to 15 centimeters. Um, so this will help us inform them uh, if they use stainless steel, they're going to have to put it farther away, or they cons could consider using a less dense metal like uh, titanium. Um, and they would have to perform their own analyses. But um, ultimately, this portion was pretty informative. Next slide. Yes, so I'm going to loop this back around to our original objectives. So we achieved a significant amount of the original objecti objectives that we set out for. The first and the primarily important one is achieving temperature levels between 300 and 400 degrees Celsius with the desired 30 watt heater. And this is important because it allows us to compare the experimental results to the actual calculated temperatures. And then like Cooper was talking about before, we found out that we need to place the, um, the unit at a distance of 22.2 centimeters. So this relates back to our other objective in the first slide. And um, also important is the desire to know the difference between the radiated and irradiated, the non-radiated and the irradiated sensors. But unfortunately, that will have to be tested at the actual ATR. So we accomplished all that we could given what we have. Also important is the fact that we examined the pressure sensors located along the gas line, which um, produce, produce similar readings, like I mentioned before, which indicates that the results that we have for this experiment are consistent and reliable. So I'd like to give our acknowledgments to our sponsor at INL, uh, particularly Joe Palmer. Um, the support we get from Dr. Yang at the, you know, our department, um, and also to uh, BDOXT. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? So, of course, this project did have some complications when it came to spacing those pressure sensors apart. If we were to do it again, we would have probably put much a much longer length of tubing between those two pressure sensors. So, w the, what I had there was probably only maybe three inches or so. We would have ha done maybe 20 or 30 feet because that's how much tubing you're going to have in the advanced test reactor. One... Um, aspect we didn't have access to, of course, is that radiation zone. So what they're going to set up in the advanced test reactor, they're going to have a control pressure sensor up high, 20, 30 feet lower, you're going to have that irradiated pressure sensor. So if we re can redo this experiment, which plans are to, mo are to move forward and make those adjustments, and we can prove that those two pressure sensors are reading the same values, it'll further increase the confidence in performing that experiment in the advanced test reactor because it'll be worth, that that experiment will be worth a lot more and they want to have this R&D done beforehand. Um, so our capsule is very small. It's about the size of a flashlight. Um, again, valid concern. Uh, do you want to go back a few slides? I think the um, flux difference, or I guess the current dis difference between the bottom and the top was something I was interested in. Um, but I think it was something that Joe told me not to be concerned about. Um, one analysis we did on the shielding was the shield and the unshielded versions. Um, I guess it's a bit tendential, but, you know, unshielded, you see a bit of an increase in the heating, um, but it's not too significant. Um, I guess in the future, if it was something that they were more concerned about, um, then they could perform that analysis and see what the temperature gradient inside of the capsule might be. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Analysis could, oh, go ahead. The analysis could probably be, uh, definitely be repeated with titanium. Um, 
perhaps it's something that I, you know, be interesting to see the results, but you know, we determined that stainless steel was probably good for the purpose. So thank you. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, we're Senior Design Team 007. Uh, I'm Travis Vaughn, Derek Freeman, Brady Arnold, Jeremy Ray. Um, and our project was the design of a digital twin based autonomous uh, control for an advanced reactor. And our um, advisor was Pref Professor Den, uh, NC State. Um, and our, um, the team we worked with was uh, Dr. Paridi Ath at NC State and then Dr. Lin Yu Lin at Idaho National Labs. Uh, and we'd also uh, had a project sponsor of, of, of INL and also Zachary for the use of the Gothic license. Um, so um, the team we um, worked with uh, are in the process of developing uh, NAMAC. And uh, we had a lot of ground to cover and to catch up on to. Uh, get up to speed on NAMAC um, and sp specifically what we were tasked to do is to examine the impact of different types of sensor malfunction within the NAMAC uh, system and on its performance and even more specifically within the Q4 implementation or the Q4 issue space and um, if, you, if you're like us at the beginning of this project what is NAMAC what is the Q4 issue space and we're going to get to you to that uh, here in the next <laughs> few slides so um, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so um, as we progressed through the project, uh, we, we honed in on the, uh, the sensor noise, the one type of fault uh, that we uh, put our time and effort into. Um, and uh, that's outlined here in red. Obviously, it leads to an error. Uh, noise um, leads to an error between, uh, you know, the recorded data and the actual um, whatever is being measured. Um, and so... Here, what is NAMAC? So NAMAC, uh, it's the nearly, nearly autonomous management control, and specifically we're looking at, at advanced SMRs. Um, it is, um, excuse me for one second. So it is, uh, it's, the system is intended to provide recommendations to operators during all modes of plant operation. Um, these recommendations are to be derived within a modern art artificial intelligence guided system. Uh, it makes use of continuous Extensive monitoring of plant status, knowledge of current component status, and plant parameter trends. Uh, the system will continuously uh, predict near-term evolution of the plant state and then ultimately recommend a course of action to plant personnel or the operators. Uh, so from the visual on the left, you can see all the tasks and responsibilities that an operator-centric um, plant control architecture uh, would require uh, from a team of operators. Uh, and ultimately the goal is to transition to this NAMAC-centered uh, control to where uh, you have a central um, control uh, system that is able to continuously um, calculate and, and run diagnosis and prognosis and decision-making uh, objectively uh, with a lot faster processing times than uh, just a team of operators. Um, and so more detailed look at NAMAC and its operational workflow. I've uh, kind of highlighted, highlighted the, um, the main gist of it over here at the right, uh, but you plant, start with the current plant state, so uh, get the data your instrumentation is, um, is reading, and it's assimilated into a hub of digital twins, and we also have more information about digital twins coming. Brady's gonna walk us through that. Um, but basically, uh, these digital twins, they diagnose the current, uh, state of the plant, be it normal operation or if it's an accident event, and then it can uh, run through 
uh, multiple um, simulated guided prognosis events, and then there's an evaluation of um, the recommended actions to see which one is uh, will be the the best course of action. And all these are, and that is uh, based upon a, pref a pre-selected preference st structure, um, whether it is for normal uh, operation or if it's for accident uh, or under an accident scenario. Um, and so a uh, few motivations uh, behind NAMAC. Um, we mentioned um, that, or, or maybe I should mention that uh, NAMAC is especially um, useful in those accident type scenarios and that it will um, limit the progression of off normal events and prevent or uh, yeah prevent unnecessary shutdowns uh, so therefore um, you have greater plan avail availability greater greater safety margins um, put this image up here ultimately want to keep steam going through those cooling towers right um, and then some economic motivations, which um, Jeremy's going to touch on more in depth, are higher cycle efficiencies and reduce operation and maintenance cost for the next gener re generation reactors and specifically uh, next generation SMR reactors. Um, so here with economics, we try to compare uh, SMRs with larger reactors. And um, for this one, we did uh, 1,100 megawatts. Um, a reactor, a large reactor, which is typically started off at $80, $80 per megawatt hour in contrast to the SMR, which is a, which started off at 28 on a smaller range, but it can go up to 130. That's for the larger ones, but you still got to think about starting off at 180 compared to a larger one versus a SMR. And with also with economics, we it was very hard for us to find for autonomous control because it really wasn't a lot and it's now being introduced. But here we're going to like introduce the day-to-day -day, uh, plant operations cost effect by loss of economy scale, and which depends on uh, staffing size and plant availability. And then also with, autom with the automations, um, it will provide a desire on st shortening the staff down with, with the autonomous control. You can go to the next one. I have a breakdown of it. And here's the cost breakdown with uh, I, I chose uh, the 50 megawatt that was typically in our range of what we were using and typically starting off with a smaller SMR is 30 million and then it could go up to 70 million with the larger ones. And with these, how we got the labor and fill and manage, I mean, uh, maintenance and repair costs and miscellaneous uh, times, well, we times this by like the percentages, and for labor costs, it was 55% is of the total um, component of operation costs, which includes your salary benefits, uh, plant personnel, and then field costs, which is one of the least. It was like around 15% of total operational costs, and then you got maintenance, which is 20, which is next, which goes down to you know you got your repair maintenance, usually typical stuff you have to repair and then your miscellaneous which is like insurance costs, property tax which was 10 percent but it's noted that with NAMAC and event and autonomous control that the uh, these training programs can cost a lot but and um the overall pr representation of NAMAC will provide a a safer and efficient nuclear power plant operation which reduce costs in the long run by limiting operator error and minimizing human error which will, can be substantial, and Brady will explain. Yeah, so um, the SMR that we are attempting to model is a sodium-based coolant, or not sodium-based, so sodium coolant uh, SMR. Um, and so the model that we decided, or not decided, that was provided for us to be able to uh, attain data about the sodium-cooled reactor is we were provided a model of the EBR2, um, the experimental breeder reactor, the last commission, uh, um, American react, or last sodium fast reactor that was um, in commission in the United States, um, built in the 1960s and achieving criticality in 1965. Um, we'll go to the next one. So the Q4 study case that we decided, or that we were given, um, is what is called a uh, loss of flow. Uh, accident scenario. So this 
uh, graph describes how the pumps are reactive to uh, what is happening in the scenario. Pump one uh, comes from a nominal uh, speed of about ra uh, 90 radians per second, decreasing to 50% of its nominal value. And to be able to supplement uh, the cooling in the reactor, pump two has been increased uh, to about one and a half, uh, to 105% of what it should or normally nominally be at. Um, the reaction that we can see in the peak fuel center line temperature of the reactor is a increase from the nominal 610, or just under 610 degrees Celsius, and raising to above 690 degrees Celsius. This is problematic, typically, as the fuel uh, having such a drastic change in temperature quickly. Um, what is attempted to be neutralized um, is this peak in peak fuel center line temperature um, by the pump two supplementing flow. I'll do this part. So um, we've given you the basics of our situation, and now we need to figure out how to model this. So what NAMAC uses to model the EBRT reactor is digital twins. You can think of these like simulations, except instead of using initial parameters and um, initial values throughout the simulation, we use real um, real-time data from a real system as the input parameters, and then it uses its own algorithms to infer other data within the reactor. Um, and um, in this specific scenario, the digital twins that we use in this model are made through machine learning rather than normal uh, theories and algorithms that people have developed. So um, what machine learning is, in it, for our case, we used um, a feed-forward neural network which um, can be understood as pretty much taking in an input vector x. Uh, we use a big X here to represent it because I couldn't really get vector notation to work. Um, and it takes in all those values in the vector, which are just all of the input values that we care about, say um, temperature from sensors in the reactor, um, flux, other things. Um, and it'll use what's called uh, hidden layers with weights and biases to calculate just whatever values it kind of wants to. And it, you end up getting a single output value or however many output values you um, define. And it pretty much just throws a bunch of uh, weights and biases that you program into it at the start and then uses a loss function based on how far your output value that you get at the end is from the true value that you're trying to get. And it tweaks this over a number of epochs to pretty much get the values to calculate what you're trying to get. And then after you've trained it enough on enough data, then it will uh, be able to kind of interpolate between different cases and you can test it on data that hasn't seen before to see whether it's working or not. Um, it's all a little out there um, and it's a pretty new field, but uh, this is what we've been working with, the system that uses these. And uh, Brady, you can resume. Yeah, so the NAMAC training that uh, we have been introduced to is a three-layer architecture that in, uh, at the very bottom introduces what is called a knowledge base. Um, this is something that has been uh, basically a cache of scenarios that have been encountered by the system and are being are going to be input into the NAMAC training um, so that it will know how to react to them. This is then uh, progressed up to the second layer called the NAMAC development layer. This is where all the training is happening when the uh, machine learning system is encountering all these various scenarios. Um, and uh, and it interacts with the third layer, which is the digital twin layer, where it, these interact, uh, where these scenarios are actually met in reality and have to be interacted and solved to be able to negate a scram uh, solution, as maintaining reactor power is always the uh, best course of action. So. Um, in the Q4 scenario that we were given, um, there were 1,024 iterations of the way that the pump two can supplementarily supply flow to the reactor. So um, these digital twins were trained on this uh, 1,024 iterations and um, that was the data set that we were given. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. 
So the digital twin system uh, is really triggered, um, or not triggered, uh, the digital twin system runs continuously and is enacted when uh, it detects a anomalous variation from a sensor, from the current sensor um, that train that it is supposed to be monitoring. Um, when it does uh, experience this abnormal event, it will then trigger and send uh, a set of data to the digital twin hub. If we'll go to the next slide. So this digital twin hub is really the basis of the NAMAC system and uh, the center to what is being trained. Um, the digital twin hub has three major components and the diagnosis twin is split into two different components. The diagnosis twin is what is encountered uh, very f at the very first when a scenario, uh, an anomalous situation has been encountered and it gathers and collects um, a very small amount of data to be able to assume what the next future transient in the reactor will be. This is then mirror, uh, communicated to the strategy inventory uh, section of the digital twin of uh, diagnosis where the large cache of data is stored and the solutions could possibly be to mitigate the, uh, the problem. So the next two digital twins um, is the next uh, station that this information is then uh, translated to is the prognosis digital twin. This uh, is the section where uh, the program, the machine learning program will respond and select a set of uh, solutions that could possibly solve the anomalous situation. This set of solutions is then uh, communicated to the strategy assessment uh, uh, section of the digital twin where a something called a safety significant factor is produced. This is a uh, calculation based on the many aspects of the machine learning um, uh, equation and determines a single solution that will then be suggested to the operator to uh, help and best mitigate the scenario and proceed with the best safety abilities. So something that we were uh, tasked to do was analyze the different iterations of the Q4 scenario. Um, this is where I used the Gothic model of the EBR2 um, to, me uh, to simulate a sodium coolant and to understand how the peak fuel center line temperature reacts to uh, different changes in pump two's supplementary flow. So the three variables that I really analyzed in this study were the delay time that pump two takes to start. This is really a feature of the digital twin system uh, accumulating and uh, reacting to the data that is being given um, and the time that it takes for the system to start reacting and start the pump increase. Um, the other two variables were the pump two ramp up speed as well as the pump two final speed um, and each of these have different trends in how the peak fuel cell line temperature will change. So these are some of the graphs that were output by my case study. As you can see, um, this is a uh, trend of the reduction of the peak fuel cell line temperature as uh, the radi as the pump speed, uh, final pump speed increases uh, over the delay time. The delay time that I used was nine through 19 seconds. There was some problems with the Gothic model. Uh, otherwise, I would have used a lot more round numbers-ish, 10 to 20 probably. Um, and as you can see, that uh, as the 35 radians per second, or second pump speed increase, that there is a very small uh, connection at the very beginning of the delay time. This indicates um, that even as the pump speed uh, time, increase time is decreased, um, there is a lower limit to how, how fast the peak fuel cell line temperature here can be reduced. Um, another aspect of these two graphs can show that uh, there is a trend uh, in the peak fuel cell line temperature as it reduces per second. 
um, there's a small, uh, it seems like a parabolic curve as the delay time increases, which implies uh, that there is a P, uh, there is an optimal delay time that can uh, change the fuel center line temperature the best, which is interesting. Uh, so the data that I was analyzing uh, was very pure and didn't have any uh, anomalies, uh, but as we go into the reality of reactors, there is a lot of sensor noise and vibrations that are being detected by these sensors, and so uh, this is also what was being analyzed. Yeah, so uh, moving on to the case study about the sensor noise, the system that we've been working with, NAMAC, is trained on pure data, and this means that when it encounters noisy data, it thinks that all that noise in it is actually what's happening in the reactor. So say your um, temperature reading goes from like 659 to 650, it thinks in like half a second your coolant temperature just dropped nine degrees Celsius, which is crazy. Um, and because of that, we don't know what's gonna happen to it when we introduce noise, how much it's gonna fail, and the types of vulnerabilities it has to that noise. So that's what our study's all about. Um, so moving on, this is the setup to our study. We have this pure signal over here. This is showing just one example from one of our um, training cases where the um, upper plenum temperature increases due to a pump failure, and we apply um, noise from the standard normal distribution to this data. Um, we um, also multiply that standard normal distribution by some magnitude of the pure signal. So in this case, this is showing 5%, which would just mean that the standard deviation of that normal distribution is 0 0.05 of the pure signal shown. Um, and that's the noise that we applied to the data set. We applied it only to that upper plenum temperature in our case, despite the fact that we were monitoring um, upper plenum temperature and two of the lower plenum temperatures. Um, and then we also only used a single initial case for our study. So like we mentioned before, there were a bunch of different initial cases with um, speeds of pump one failing, but we used this specific one right here, which was, I think, case 400. We just kind of selected it. Um, and what is important to know about this is that only the first 20 seconds of this matter for our part of the study, because um, what NAMAC is doing is it's taking in the first 20 seconds of data that we feed it, and then it's predicting what happens to the reactor after that, as well as what happens to the reactor when the recommended operation that it has is implemented. So um, really all that we're paying attention to is this peak all the way up here to like 611 degrees Celsius at the 22nd mark. Um, it doesn't even know what's going on with the pumps, really. It just knows this uh, fuel center line temperature. So that's um, where we're at with that. And here is some charts of what we uh, got from the Diagnosis Digital Twin. We ran 100 cases for each of the following noise amounts. Uh, zero was the control. We only needed to run that once because it always produces the same results when no noise is present. And then we used 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1, 2.5, 5, and 25, or 10 and 25% noise. And in each run, we asked the diagnosis digital twin to take in all that noisy upper plenum temperature and diagnose what it thought the fuel center line temperature was at 20 seconds. Um, and it also had uh, diagnoses of those first 20 seconds as well. As you can see on these graphs, um, the control is all the way on the left there. And you can see that very closely matches the GSIM outputs, which is the true value in the simulation. And then as we increase the noise, so for the next one, um, it's already getting really noisy at just 0.25% noise of the input data. And this is what the um, system is predicting the fuel center line temperature to be based on that input noise. Um, so we haven't done anything to that data in terms of noise. This is just what the system is calculating. And then it gets even worse with the uh, one in 10% noise here. You can note the change of axes. This one goes all the way up to 760 degrees Celsius at one point. It thinks the fuel center line just suddenly went up a crazy amount. And then um, I have this table here mostly for questions if we need to review any data. Um, what's important here is the control data. That is the data that we received from the control case. This is assumed to be mostly correct because this is stuff that the NAMAC system has already encountered a lot, it's been tested on. So that we already kind of know is correct. And then we compare the outputs given the noisy data that we generated in this table below. Um, and we have some charts here that 
give a more visual representation of that. We were mainly focused on the fuel centerline temperature because the diagnosis digital twin is the only one that really deals with the input data. The other ones just take in what the diagnosis digital twin is spitting out and it does its own conclusions based on that. So we're really g focusing on the core of the problem, which is uh, faulty diagnoses. Um, and you can see here on this graph, um, as we increase the noise, we get on average um, higher uh, diagnosed uh, fuel center line temperatures, but we also get really large standard deviations around that. Um, those error bars are representing one standard deviation. So you can see uh, already getting to the 2.5% noise case, which is not too much noise. Um, we're getting pretty big standard deviations of about 10 degrees Celsius, um, which is not that good. And then um, we also have the mean square error of those, which is kind of like the standard deviation. Um, it's just showing how much error is in the data compared to the true value. Um, and we also uh, decided to look at the number of times that the pump was tripped at time zero. Um, what this is pretty much representing is that the NAMAC system sees what's going on in the reactor and it's like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just gonna turn up the pump because that's, um, in our key four scenario, all that it really knows how to do is change um, the pump to speed. So if it's tripping at time zero, when the control is tripping at um, time 34 after the uh, sensors pick up that data, then what that's saying is that the system just is just doing the only thing it knows how to do. It's kind of freaking out there. Um, another thing that we did to the input data is we applied a tailing average of the data using a size of six. And all that does is we take in the six most recent data points behind the current one, and we average all those to get um, a slightly more smooth value. And interestingly, that actually increased the number of times tripped at time zero for the lower noise percentages. This is probably due to the fact that we're kind of averaging our transients, and um, the data is kind of lagging behind the true value. And for our conclusions, um, clearly the introduction of noise to even just one sensor in the system really uh, led to some major flaws in the system. It couldn't accurately diagnose the plant state anymore. It was giving us uh, really bad predictions of what to do and uh, simple averaging didn't help that much either. So we really need some more uh, robust solutions than just simple um, noise smoothing to get this system to give us reliable results. Um, of course, training the neural nets on already noisy data may help with this, as it would be more used to seeing these kinds of problems. But then that brings up the problem of when noise is varying, because the way neural nets are trained, um, when you give it data that's even slightly different from what it knows, it just completely messes up. And like a change from one to 5% noise in a system might give completely unexpected results as well. So. If we ran a similar study, if we did that, we'd probably get about the same results. And then for our future work, um, we recommend having additional qualifications of failure in a um, sensitivity study like this so that we can really nail down what's going wrong with it. Um, some of these may be number of times of exceeding safety limits. Um, in this case, our safety limit was really high. We had 800 degrees Celsius for the fuel centerline temperature. Um, number of times it may initiate an unnecessary scram command. We didn't actually get any this time. And then um, whenever control actions are issued, whenever no anomalies are actually present, which is a really important one because you don't want control actions to be messing with your core when nothing's really going wrong. That's, that's a really bad situation too. Um, and then we also would like to see solutions for mitigating the noise. Um, differentiating the trips that are due to noise versus true anomalies, which is what I was getting to with um, control actions issued when no anomalies are present. We need solutions for that, as well as um, training the digital twins on some level of noise to see if that impacts its tolerance to noise. And then, since we were studying a very simple case, the Q4 scenario, um, there are more advanced scenarios of this that we should test in the future or other teams should test in the future. The Q8 and Q10 scenarios have already been developed. These take into account economic considerations as well as material failures like um, pump wear and maximum pump acceleration. And we didn't study these because we were trying to keep it really simple, just see how adding noise to the system made 
changes even in a simple case. But once these problems have been uh, fixed and kind of figured out, we can move up to more complex systems and eventually get up to simulating a full plant um, with it more advanced scenarios and being able to calculate some economic values that may help in determining the utility of this. And again, our acknowledgments. Um, Dr. Din was our advisor through this, and we also worked with Dr. Paridi and Dr. Lin from NC State and Idaho National Lab, and Zachary Nuclear provided our license for Gothic, which was used to generate all of our training data. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one thing I would advise: don't call results of quantum data. Okay. I think it should be called the synthetic results. Yeah. Or synthetic something. Mm -hmm. Don't use word data. Data is really for uh, experimental results. And uh, so. Now you know that uh, your assumptions were not met with your model results. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think you're going to do if you continue with this? So um, that's kind of with our recommendations um, th in the future work. Um, to continue this, I mean, the first thing that I would think of to do is we were training the digital twins on pure data. I'd really like to see what happens if we give it the type of noisy data that you expect from a reactor instead of what you'd expect from a simulation. So, um, because when we actually implement a NAMAC system, we're going to be using real sensor data from real reactors. So we want to feed it the data that it should be getting from those reactors. Um, but some other things that may help um, in the implementation of this, it's really hard to say um, how we want to deal with noise but some very advanced smoothing algorithms have been developed that we may be able to implement. And as well as being able to train additional models using machine learning to maybe interpret the noise and give uh, data that's very close to what we expect to be the actual values may be valuable well, as well. I would recommend something see how it flies with you because you did the work and I was just in the audience. When you look at this, let's just say the, the, uh, the fuel sensor temperature, for example, mm -hmm. there's if you go back to actual physics equation itself, and you look at the measurement variations that you saw, let's just say from the DR2, create actually a, uh, a multi column equation that actually predicts maximums and minimums based on that noise that you have, mm -hmm. and then have the physics equation spit out with the multi column assistant a sigma around those things. Then you actually be more in the reality zone. Yeah, and that's definitely a good consideration. One of the uh, big things to consider about the NAMAC system, though, is that we're using machine learning to develop our algorithms. And as we saw earlier on, uh, it was kind of hard to explain it. We're using literally just a linear function to calculate um, between these nodes W times XI plus B. So these weights are just a coefficient applied to the input values, x, xi in the input vector, and then it adds b to it. So, so uh, these are really easy to calculate. It's very fast. What you just did is what I learned in statistics and you did too. b mm -hmm. plus sigma, best estimate plus sigma. That's really what this is all about. Yeah, this is. Let's go back to basics. That's what yeah, so that's the whole um, advantage of using this. We're not developing advanced theories and advanced equations to really make a high fidelity simulation of this. We're trying to infer from the input data that we give it um, pretty much what's happening in the reactor without having to use really computationally expensive methods. Um, so that's kind of the beauty of this. The, altern the other side of that is that we literally don't know what's happening inside of the algorithm for this. It's completely convoluted from us. We are tossing it data, and it's using linear functions to generate completely unrelated things. So um, that's one of the big drawbacks of this, is that troubleshooting this is very difficult, and it needs a lot of rigorous testing to really verify the validity of this. And maybe there's another answer, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's difficult, but go. That is definitely <laughs> possible.
Yeah, Grayson? So why are you using activation folks? We are using... Uh, Yeah, I skipped over that in the slides. We are using a nonlinear activation function. I forget which one I think folding activation functions for this. Um, so we are using nonlinear um, relationships in this, but at the basis of it, um, it's the computational cost of this is mostly just um, linear functions. So it, it really doesn't require that much computational power to run through these uh, neural networks once they're already trained. Yeah, we do use uh, nonlinear activation functions in the feed forward neural networks. And uh, more advanced models of this actually use recurrent neural networks as well as more advanced neural networks. Um, we're just working with a very simple one at the moment. But thank you, Grayson. Yes? Yeah, on your economic side of things, um, So when you say basis, uh, well, um, theoretically, it would be all these are just assumptions because it was, is very like, it was really all assumptions. So we would just put in numbers that we could find from like other sources and then estimating them all out together, and then these are where we rounding them out to. Yeah, there's some data out there. So the way that that is written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just a basic assumption that was, yeah, so. Yeah, another thing to note is um, in our project, our main focus on the economic side is reducing operator costs and increasing plant efficiency. Um, that side of it, we're kind of leaving to the SMR engineers to figure out. We're not really focusing on designing an SMR to be more efficient than a large reactor. Um, but yeah, that is definitely a good point to bring up that our numbers might be a little off on that part. Yeah. When you're talking about OpEx, you're not talking about design. You just have to talk about operation yeah. side of things. People have time. It's nine to ten days. Yeah. So, so it's just it's important when you start thinking about using AI or whatever, all these things to reduce, to be more efficient, so to reduce, hopefully reduce some labor costs there. Yeah. Um, it's important to know where the basis of that is. Yeah. One of the main points that we had in our previous presentations that I think we skipped over this time is that one of the uh, big points of using this system is that a small reactor isn't that much less complicated than a full reactor. And full reactors need full teams of operators to run them. So when you have a series of small reactors in one plant, you need a huge team of operators monitoring each one. So this system will reduce the amount of workload on each of those operators and possibly reduce the number of operators necessary to run each small reactor. You might even be able to get down to where just a couple operators are running like 20 reactors at the same time if this is developed well enough and tested. So good afternoon, everybody. We are the Duke Energy um, Transition and Optimization for a four loop PWR core. We're trying to transition from an 18th month cycle to a 24 month cycle. So you may be wondering, why would we try to change to a two year cycle? Well, as you can imagine, out rate, um, out outages cost money because during an outage, the reactor isn't running, so you won't be making any money. Um, we lose about a million dollars per day, so roughly over six years, we would be saving about $30 million. 
Also, we would like to reduce stress on the operational components during startup and shutdown. Um, Duke Energy gave us some required um, restraints to stay within. One being we needed to increase the access rate to reactivity. By um, the way we did that was changed from a three batch core to a two batch core. Um, the access reactivity would be coming from us having more fresh fuel in our assembly because in the two batch we would have about half compared to the three batch would be about third. Um, also, we needed to include burnable poisons to combat that excess um, reactivity. So, and we needed to include gadolinia. Um, in our 18 month cores, we use IFPA and WABA. IFPA is the intercal field burnable absorber and it's dichronium um, dibora, I mean dibrom, dibora. Um, and WABA is the wet angler burnable absorber. That is aluminum oxide. It's aluminum oxide um, bor boron um, carbide. And our 24 month core would use IFBA and GAD, and gadolinium is um, gadolinia oxide, basically. Um, so we came up with three options. The first one being um, a transition cycle with 96 feet assemblies followed by a 24 month with 97 um, feet assemblies. Option two would be a transition cycle with 96 feet assemblies and then trans, I mean then a trans, followed by a 24 month um, cycle with 109 feet assemblies. And then our third option would be just a direct transition from the 18 months to the 24 months using 120 feet assemblies. <clears throat> okay, so how are we actually modeling these cores? So Duke Energy provided us with an 18 month core uh, from a core within their fleet. And so we've taken that restart file and we've implemented an ultra low leakage pattern that's seen in our transition cycle up here. And so basically you use uh, the ring of fire on the outer edge to draw the power out from the center of the core and also you can notice that there's no assemblies on the outer periphery and that will reduce the leakage and uh, introduce uh, positive, sorry, and increase the neutron economy within the core. Um, as Jindai mentioned, we are gonna be transitioning from WABA to uh, GAD designs in order to hold down excess reactivity throughout the cycle. Um, and so once we know where we're gonna put our feeds, as you can see in this core, this is the uh, optimal positioning for the feed assemblies for a 96 batch or 96 feet assembly core. And so once we determine where our feed assemblies are gonna be located, we have um, all these empty spaces in between that we have to fill with assemblies from the previous cycle. And so what we did was we, did, we took a K infinity ranking from those assemblies and we filled them starting with the first row in from the periphery from the uh, ring of fire so that uh, we have the most reactivity and it slowly decreases as you approach the center of the core to obviously balance out those power distributions and um, keep the peaking factors relatively low. If you have feed assemblies and twice burned assemblies next to each other, you're gonna have really bad peaking factors. So we did that to maintain those peaking factors as closely as possible. And then once we determined another aspect, sorry, another aspect of uh, the shuffling, the reloading is uh, the assembly burn up gradients. And so this is just an image here that depicts this assembly here in E6, or sorry, in A11, uh, that we shuffled from E6. And so from the image, you can tell that this left half of the core was facing towards the center. And so it saw a higher flux and a higher power. And therefore, or sorry, the other way around, sorry, yeah. And then we put it facing the other way so that we can extract more of the reactivity from the fresh fuel that's left on the left half here. And so to do this, to model our cores, we're using Studzix core management system. Uh, essentially, uh, Casma 4 is used in a 2D space to model uh, the assemblies, and it uses a two group, sorry, a 70 group uh, transport theory, and it can collapses that down to two groups for which CMS link uh, compiles the card image file, which is essentially a binary file that can be read into uh, Simulate 3, and then Simulate 3 is the two-group uh, nodal code 
that uses a diffusion theory model to deplete cores in a three-dimensional space. And so what are the model constraints that we're working with? So similar to any uh, core design problem, you're going to have um, power peaking factors, you're going to have your enthalpy rise factors, you're going to have soluble boron, and you're going to have uh, pin exposure limits. So the pin exposure limits prove to be the greatest problem for us, being that they're uh, integrated actually from the, over the entire channel of the fuel. And so those are set currently to be 62 gigawatt days per metric ton. And so in order to extract as much fuel or as much energy as possible from the fuel, we need to uh, increase those limits at the end of the day. And so from the previous slide, again, we had to rotate assemblies to make sure that we weren't violating any of those limits. And so uh, you can see on the slide that there's some hard and soft limits that we've been provided from coursework and from industry advisors as well. Uh, I'm not going to touch too far into detail, but uh, FQ is mainly used for clad integrity as it relates to LOCA operations or LOCA accents and F delta H for DNB ratios. And obviously, you want to maintain a soluble boron concentration below around 1,400, so your uh, MTC will be negative through all uh, core life points and all power levels as well. And so there's a lot of information to be uh, presented with GAD um, optimizations and assembly optimizations. So Duke Energy's core that they provided used 12 uh, WABA assemblies with eight rods each, and we were tasked with kind of finding an equivalence between those. And so what we were able to conclude was that the increased GAD enrichment will have longer hold down throughout the cycle. And because obviously the flux will have to deplete the GAD. And so the more enriched, the more weight percent GAD that you have, the longer it's going to take for that to deplete out. And so if you have more GAD rods, you're going to have a, a more uniform um, depletion of that assembly instead of those just peaks in that assembly where the GAD rods are located. And so it was optimal to place those GAD rods right next to the, um, the water rods where the flux is going to be higher and there's not going to be as much absorption due to the fuel. So after we determined our optimal lattice designs and built the cross-section library, that's when we began to model the different options that we determined. So with the first option, this is the option one that consists of the transition cycle with 96 feet assemblies and then the 24-month cycle that has 97 feet assemblies. With the, one, uh, with the transition cycle, we modeled that and it got to an EOC, EOC about uh, 615 effective full power days. But we ran into a problem after we tried to run the 24-month cycle after that as it did not reach 24-month cycles. 24 month cycle. So to circumvent this, we decided to cut the transition cycle short to a length of about 18 months. And this gave us enough excess reactivity to reach 24 months with the 97 feed assemblies. And then in terms of the parameters, this option one the with the 97 feeds reached a cycle length of 695 effective full power days. This was achieved with a T average and power coast down during the last month of operation. And in terms of the constraints with the boron and the peaking factors, they were both satisfied. However, the maximum pin exposure did exceed 62 gigawatt days per metric ton. And then here's a more in-depth view of the burnable poison loading. As you can see, it has the feed assemblies denoted with the IFPA, IFPA total, the GAD total, along with the GAD enrichment. Uh, the, in terms of uranium enrichment, all assemblies are 495 in order to load as much fuel as possible into the core. And uh, in terms of the IFPA, you can see on the outer rims, it's mainly just IFPA rods used in the, f in the feeds. And the, on the outer periphery of the core, and as you t went to the center of the core, that's when we started to use JAD and IFA configurations. And through the different, as you can see, in the face adjacent assemblies in the center and some along the ring of fire, that's where we used the very poisoned assemblies containing high amounts of IFA and high amounts of JAD. And then here is the maximum boron concentration of our di various cycle iterations. As you can see in the first cycle iteration, we started out with a very high max boron concentration as we just had the loading pattern with feed assemblies with no burnable poison loading. And then as we move from iteration to iteration, that's when we began to add burnable poisons into the assemblies that were peaking, trying to bring down the boron as well as the peaking factors. And eventually, by the 28th or so iteration, we began to reach acceptable level levels of the boron concentration. And here is the peaking over time with the different cycle iterations. As you can see, it was mainly just a matter of trial and error trying to reduce the peaking, and eventually we were able to reach satisfactory values. And then next in option two, this also uses the same transition cycle that option one used, 
However, this one will include 109 feet assemblies um, and, long, and then 84 one spurn assemblies from the transition cycle. This cycle did reach a uh, 24 month cycle at a 700 effective full power days without the need for a T average or power coast down. And in terms of the boron limits, it did exceed 1400 parts per million. However, it was below the hard, the soft, uh, the hard limit of 1450 parts per million. Uh, the peaking factors were satisfied, but and just like option one, the maximum pin exposure was exceeded. And here's a more in-depth view of the burnable poison loading. Very similar to option one, how the outer periphery is mainly just IFBA rods, and then towards the center, that's where we used variations in IFBA and GAD quantities. And just like in option one, the face adjacent assemblies had contained very poisoned assemblies. And then similar to option one, we started out with a pure core with no burnable poisons and then began to add burnable poisons through each iteration, bringing down the boron and the peaking. And eventually we reached a value below 1450, however, it wasn't under 1400. And then here is the peaking factors. Again, another cycle of trial and error, just trying to reduce the peaking. And eventually we reached, a, we reached some values that were below two as well as below 1.6 that were satisfactory. That brings us to our last option, which is option three. And as opposed to option one and two, this cycle uh, was just a direct jump to 24 months. So what that means was we're going to have to load as much reactivity into the core as possible. And we did this by uh, using 120 feet assemblies and 73 once burned assemblies from the cycle that Duke provided with us. And we arranged those uh, using the same K infinity ranking as we did with the other cycles. Um, using this loading pattern, you can see that we have a very thick ring of fire, uh, traditional checkerboard uh, on, the, on the inside and eight assemblies on the outer periphery of the core, which is not traditional. Uh, using this loading pattern, we actually reached a final exposure of 710 effective full power days. Our boron limits were satisfied, our peaking factors were satisfied, but again, our pin exposures were exceeded. Here you can see, uh, like the others, the ring of fire consists of mostly IFA, but now we're, trying, we're starting to implement more uh, GAD on the ring of fire because there's more face adjacent assemblies and as you move <coughs> inward on the core you have a mixture of GAD and IFA but this is just you know trial and error as before and here same thing is we start with a fresh core there's no burnable poison so this has so we have a higher boron concentration at our zero iteration but as we progress we actually reach satisfactory limits at about 20 uh, versions. And here we have the peaking factors over our iterations. And as you can see, we satisfy our limits here as well. So all this is great, but you know, it really matters money. So after we modeled each of the options, we looked at the economics of each of them. and what we had to do was take into account the mining, conversion, fabrication, the carrying costs, and all of that good stuff. And on our per assembly basis, we actually had to take into account the uh, displacement of fuel that GAD has, which is going to affect the cost of every assembly. And unfortunately, we were not provided with a spreadsheet to do this, so we had to write our own script to calculate everything. And as you can see, with the two transition cycles, which are both 96 feet assemblies. Uh, the upfront cost for those are 111.129 million. Cycle 29, which was the first 24 month cycle, upfront cost was 112.275 million. The 24 month cycle with 109 feet was 126.179 million upfront. And lastly, the direct transition had an upfront cost of 138.87 million. And as you can see, we assumed equilibrium for all of these. And we, for our first option, which was the most economically appealing, we got about 6.5 6 cents per kilowatt hour. And our second option was 7.5 cents per kilowatt hour. And our last option, which was the most expensive, was 8.4 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, in conclusion, our pin exposure limits, as um, my fellow colleagues said, were a little bit over. So 
it would need to be extended to about 70 gigawatt days per metric ton of um, uranium. And we also were able to prove that the 495 weight percent um, fuel is proved to be, um, was proved to be able to reach 24 months. Also, um, in the future works, we would like to be able to do a highly enriched um, fuel that's about six to seven percent, but we didn't, we weren't able to get that in time. Um, here's some acknowledgements. Um, shout out to our Duke advisors, um, Dallas and Duncan, and also our department advisor here, Dr. Scott Ponte. <laughs> Is there any question? Thank you. Sure, there will be questions. Here. So, am I, are, are we safe to assume? Are we safe to assume that, based on your economic analysis, that it would not be prudent to go to 24 month cycle since your cost is higher than potential revenue? Um, yeah, so the main goal is to just cut down on your uh, outages, right? And we are trying to reduce this by transitioning from an IPA WABA configuration to an IPA GAD. And every time you're refueling with WABA, you have uh, increased exposure, and this is why we're transitioning to, uh, you know, an IPA GAD configuration, because we don't have to mess with any exposures, you know, to, like, personnel during refueling, and as well as our components, you know, starting up and uh, shutting down your reactor. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I think um, I'd say a little bit more um, analysis on the economic side would be valuable to understand. Because I think you said on the revenue right up front that you're, you'd be $30 million, I think you said, so $3 million per day, right? Mm -hmm. So that's on the revenue side that you'd be missing out. On the cost side, you have the fuel cost, then you have potential uh, <laughs> reduction in cost of operation. So I think... I think a net would be valuable. Also, if you go back to that slide, um, I just want to get that right. Fuel cycle cost is 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour, which would be $65 per megawatt hour. So are you, are we missing a decimal there? Yeah, I might be missing a decimal. It's okay. probably supposed to be in right, I just per, wanted per kilowatt hour. $6, is yeah. per, $6 per megawatt hour is about the fuel cost that the industry sees. Thank you, Ashwin. Another question? Yes. Yeah, it's just, it's just a quick question on this. You're going against the trend of the company that hired you to analyze 18 months versus 24 months. Now the boss is going to call you and all four of you and tell him that don't do it. It's no good. So you're going to be solid on your feet. How are you going to explain that result? Because right now I'm not convinced. Well, the, um, the economics are actually like debatably worse. So like there's no denying that, but the main benefits of switching to 24 month are the, the, the less, the reduced risk for the plant components. And so obviously during shutting down, starting up, what, like what Max was saying, is that you're not gonna be starting those pumps up and shutting them down more or less frequently. So you're not gonna have to deal with those maintenance issues per se, yeah. So. Next step would be quantifying that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Laser. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely speak to that. Um, you know, advanced test reactor—they're always pushing to more and more and more days because, I mean, if you're on the upside, um, anytime you go down, you don't really know if it's. You know, it's a setback, or is it two weeks out before you come back up again? Um, so that just more, more and more and more as much as you can get from a full plant reliability. So there's different metrics to look at. Um, my thought, and it's taken me all afternoon to kind of get to this spot, but you know, in, in the three, present three presentations we've seen on these transition cycles or uh, PWR cycles, uh, you know, the number of one million dollars per day gets thrown out a lot. But from a, from a plant operator, they have they typically have more than nuclear reactors in the fleet. So is it is does the fleet actually lose one million dollars per day if all they have to do is uh, you know fire up a, a gas peaker just for the you know the few days that they're down to refuel two weeks to, you know two weeks to a month? 
I mean, is it really at that big of an impact? I, think about that. I, I don't know the answer. Maybe I just said something stupid, but. Um, no, that's a really good question. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it either, actually, because we weren't providing access to any of those, those values. I mean, um, best I can say is, I mean, the averages were like 30 days for the outages. So, I mean, I would assume that they're, from our industry advisors, we kind of informed that they're around a million. So that's what we've just been told to work with. Would it be safe to say to assess the, you know, the, the cost savings from going to um, 24 months could be offset by, or even on the other way, maybe uh, fuel savings is, is uh, on the one, on the 12 month, you save on fuel cost and going to 24 months, you save on maintenance cost because you're, you're down less. Um, but think about it more holistically, you know, what is the cost of running a fossil source for that same amount of time Where's the cost? Uh, what you know? What are the other rubrics for which you can assess? So um, it, <clears throat> it's, I think it's more of a comment than a question. Um, so from a pragmatic point of view, I mean, so first of all, we know these, these analyses are very, very complex. But I simply throw out there that um, every plant type except the 17 by 17 has already moved to 24-month cycles. So there is some more than empirical evidence that that's a good thing to do, right? So it's been demonstrated. So the 14s, the 15s, the 16s, the BWRs, they're all done it. So, I mean, so I, and I understand, and you have to look at it closely. The other thing I would uh, mention is you didn't talk a lot about, um, you know, the um, when you do go to a higher enrichment, you're going to be able to really cut back on batch size a lot. And, of course, now SWU is going to go up. And, but that gives you another flexibility, another variable, that you can you can work with in your in your design. So um, there's more parameters to consider, and you can continue to to chew on this. But um, a lot of people have looked at this, and um, I think I mean the industry has got a multi multi million dollar program going on to kind of make this go make this happen. And I don't I don't think that many people would be working on it if it if it wasn't pretty feasible. But just some thoughts on that. One more. One more. Yeah, th thanks, team. This is uh, really good work. I, I'm not as interested in the economic uh, because I think you you basically proved slash learned what we all kind of knew, which is this is hard to get to without having the higher enrichments and the peak pin burnup limits being extended. I uh, I would like, could you go back to the slide where you're talking about the the burnable absorber patterns, um, uh, like way back. Um, <laughs> the the if bagad combinations versus if bawaba combinations, um, yeah. All right. So I was a little curious a, as you're going through and trying to figure out. Um, landed on like seventy six if uh, two weight percent gad. How many options did you find you needed to be able to work with? Like, do you find you need to have eight, ten, twelve, twenty different burnable absorber? Uh, options to work with in order to just manage peaking, or were you able to do get by with less? Well, how? What'd you find out? So when we were actually doing the four ground lease sampling, we generated our own assembly library with probably two hundred plus different assemblies. For this specific analysis, we took the the core that you guys provided us, and it's a simple, just a relative difference over the the core length, which is the PPM bur or PPM boron concentration, and so. That, this was the optimal, the 76 from the 104 is what you guys had. So the, dropping that down because gadolinium is obviously significantly stronger than boron 10. And so that reduction in IFA from 104 to 76 proved to be the best option to uh, receive these results. Did I touch on that well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any more questions for this group? Then we thank you.
please. Yes. Come on. <laughs> Cool. So before we start, congrats to everyone who's made it through the uh, last four and a half hours or so. Um, it's been a long one, but finally wrapping it up, almost dinner time. So we're the last group in this uh, in senior design groups. We're designing a 20 megawatt pebble bed reactor to be proposed as a, an experimental facility in the future. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank our faculty instructors, uh, Dr. Pascal Ruslin, uh, Dr. Kostin and Ivanov, as well as our industry mentors from X Energy. They've been instrumental in helping us learn the actual code that we've been using, as well as um, advising our design. Uh, Sonat Sen and Dr. Eben Mulder. So before we get started, here's a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, first, we're going to go over what a pebble bed reactor is. Um, for those of you who may be more familiar with light water reactors, how it's different from that technology. Uh, the motivation of why we're interested in this product. Uh, sorry, why we're interested in this project. Uh, then we'll go through the methods of how we actually did this core analysis and design, uh, the parametric studies that we used to inform our final core design, our actual final design, a brief economic analysis to give a rough estimate of fuel cycle costs, uh, what we learned from this project, and then how we can improve our actual design in the future. So uh, pebble bed reactors are in this family of graphite moderated high temperature gas cooled reactors. Ours uses uh, helium as its coolant because of its high thermal conductivity. Um, uh, the traditional fuel in a LWR is a pin and it stays in one spot. In a, in a PBR, we actually have uh, fuel kernels embedded in a graphite matrix. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, with this new fuel design, we can actually reach significantly higher burn-up limits than traditional reactor fuel. And it also allows us, and the, and the design of a PBR allows us to do online refueling, so we don't have any downtime. So one thing that we're gonna be talking about a little bit later in our presentation, for those who are unfamiliar, in a PBR, the fuel actually flows through the reactor. And we talk about pebble passes. So a pebble pass is when we have a, a pebble starts at the top of the core, makes its way through the bottom, and then based on the, how much that pebble has gotten burnt, we can either throw it away or put it back at the top of the core and put it through. And so that would be one pebble pass. If we do it more than once, it means that the pebble flows through the core more than one time. So the actual fuel we're using is uh, triso fuel. Uh, this is uh, X Energy's company's fuel, and it is a spherical fuel that can reach high burn-up limits, about 180 gigawatt days per metric ton. The XC100, which is their 100 megawatt thermal, uh, sorry, 100 watt megawatt electric reactor actually uses seven grams heavy metal per fuel, uh, per fuel fuel, and a 15.5% U235 enrichment. This fuel is much safer than the more traditional fuels, capable of withstanding thermal stresses of up to 1800 C for over 300 hours. And the actual fuel pellet particles themselves act as their own containment, containing 99.99% of fission barriers. And they also allow for reactivity control and heat removal without any other mechanisms. So the design of this fuel, we have this outer here, this outer big uh, pebble here is a graphite matrix. Inside of this graphite matrix, we have thousands of these tiny fuel kernels. Inside this fuel kernel, the core is our actual uranium fuel. Then we have an inner pyrolytic carbon layer, sorry, a porous carbon layer that allows for the compensation of fission gas products and swelling. And then we have an inner pyrolytic carbon layer, a silicon carbide layer, which is our main fission product barrier, and an outer pyrolytic carbon layer. And then our figure three here just shows that uh, this fuel, and we just want to talk about briefly that even though there are can be manufacturing defects in this fuel, it is still safe with those defects. So now we move on to the motivation, why we're actually interested in this kind of um, a reactor. So first and foremost, this is a reactor that is being proposed to be considered to be built at NC State in the near future. Um, this type of reactor can serve uh, some very interesting roles. It allows us to study optimization techniques in pebble bed reactors, the operational behavior a bit more, as well as uh, forecast costs and allow us to gauge public sentiment. You know, One thing that might be useful is if we have a research facility that's operating safely for an extended period of time, the public might be feel more confident that that technology is safe. 
Um, now I'm going to go through the methods of how we actually perform this analysis. So we are using the very superior old programs framework, or VSOP as we call it. So there are a couple of unique challenges in modeling pebble bed reactors that are not uh, present in more traditional reactors. The first thing is our fuel. It has double heterogeneity in our fuel because we have our fuel kernels, and then those kernels are embedded in graphite. So we have to be able to uh, generate resonance integrals that accurately, accurately capture the uh, reaction rates, even though this geometry is a bit more complicated. Then we also have to account for the, f the fuel flowing through the core. In most reactor simulations, our fuel is static, um, and this is a big difference in ours. And finally, we have to be able to pe model pebble passes. Like I said, you know, a pebble can flow through the core more than once, and we need to be able to remember the burn up of that pebble after we took it out of the previous run and put it in the new one. And finally, like all good uh, uh, core design, uh, VSOP can do multi-physics. So we were able to do thermal hydraulics as well as uh, neutronics and have them feed back into each other. So here's our workflow. We start with our fuel design and our material properties. These go into the application called Zoot. And Zoot is our resonance integral uh, calculator. So this creates our resonance integrals that we use for our actual simulations. Then we go feed those into Citation. Now Citation is our diffusion solver. We do four group diffusion and um, this takes temperature as, as an input for different material properties. Those temperatures actually inform the different kinds of reactions and cross-sections that we might need. And then after our citation is done, we can feed it into Thermex. And Thermex is our thermal hydraulic solver. So citation feeds in the power per pebble, uh, the flux distributions, and then it produces temperature spec the temperatures that we need in citation. So we feed these back into each other until the uh, temperatures that, that Thermex produces matches the temperatures that are in citation. And that's how we do uh, core design, for example. So now I'm going to briefly go over our project requirements. So the first requirement we have for our project is that we want our project to op our core to operate at 20 megawatt thermal. Um, now the second one is a slightly different, a slightly, slightly weird requirement. We just talked about how pebbles can actually go up to 180 gigawatt days per ton. Um, but it, within the scope of our project, we were limited to 125 gigawatt days per ton. This was just something that we were given and that we had to work with. Um, we want a power density peaking factor less than 1.7. We need a maximum fuel temperature different, uh, less than 950 degrees C during steady state operations, as well as a maximum fuel temperature less than 1700 C during our DLFOC. Now that's a depressurized loss of force cooling accident. That's our design basis accident. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. We're also going to limit ourselves to less than 10 pebble passes to the core. And finally, we want our temperature coefficients to be negative over all operating conditions. Obviously, we want to have a safe reactor and have it be able to shut itself down in an accident scenario. And uh, finally, we need, to we need to minimize our fuel cycle costs. Even though this is proposed to be a research facility, we do want to keep those costs down so we can extend its lifetime and uh, have a, you know, a flexibility in what we're actually doing in the facility. So, in our project, we're going to briefly talk about what we've done so far. Um, one of the big challenges we had actually working with VSOP is that it's a relatively old program, and so it still uses the card style input of like Fortran 77 or punch cards. It makes it really annoying to, to work with. It takes a long time to write input files. So we've actually developed a Python library to automate this process for us. It's been extremely helpful. Um, this allows us to perform more simulations faster and also ensure that we are not making any silly mistakes doing it by hand. And the second thing is that VSOP does not produce visualizations of any kind. Um, all of the output is put into text files, and we need to be able to understand those results. And it's a lot easier to just look at a graph and say, oh, this is what's happening in my core, rather than having to look at a block of text and trying to figure it out yourself. Um, so. There's three main studies we performed to inform our final core design. We first looked at how pebble passes affects our parameters of merit. So that's, you know, we want to look at how does the power peaking, for example, differ with one pebble pass versus 10 pebble passes. Um, we studied how different fuel enrichments would affect our core design. And then finally, we looked at the core dimensions and the fuel volume that we're using to how that affect our parameters of merit. So I'm going to pass it off to Airshad to talk about these studies. 
Okay, so uh, for our parametric studies, um, like Grayson had mentioned, we had done a pebble pass study, an enrichment study, and then a geometry study. I would just like to uh, say the initial design that we were given was a 196 and a half centimeter core height with a 90 centimeter radius. Um, and we were given 10 passes initially at 19.6% uh, fuel enrichment. Um, so we started with a pebble pass study. Um, I'd just like to say um, we are going through four different uh, parameters of merit that we visualized with our Python, Python script. And for those that can't really see it, um, top left is burn up. Right below that is our average fuel cycle cost. You have power density peaking factor on the top right, and below that is our maximum center point temperature. So we went between one to 10 pebble passes um, with 19.6% enrichment is what we were initially given. Um, and you could see that as you increase the pebble passes, you're going to have an increased burn up. As you're cycling the pebbles back through the core more and more, you're gonna be able to achieve a higher burn up. Um, and with this, you're gonna utilize less fuel overall, which will help minimize your uh, fuel cycle cost. Something that I wanna point out actually is that we found the minimum fuel cycle cost at eight pebble passes. Um, which uh, went into our final design when we were considering it. Uh, power density peaking factor was decreasing, and you could see it's uh, actually well below our 1.7 that we're looking at, and maximum center point temperature is increasing. It's actually above our goal, and something that I'd like to just preface is maximum center point temperature was something that we were actually uh, trying to uh, get under control throughout our studies, and it's something that we looked at in our final design. Now, another thing is uh, burn up is actually way above our 125 gigawatt days per uh, ton of heavy metal. Um, and that's something that in our enrichment study we looked into a bit closely. Um, so enrichment study, uh, we went between 10% uh, enrichment all the way up to the 19.6% enrichment that we were given. Um, you could see actually uh, as you increase enrichment, you're gonna have a higher burn up, which is expected. You could see that we actually are able to get below our goal when you go below around 18% enrichment, um, which we considered for our final design, getting below that enrichment value. You could see fuel cycle cost. Um, you might not be able to tell, but there is a dramatic change in fuel cycle cost um, when it comes to varying enrichments. So that's something that we looked at as well. You have power density peaking again below our 1.7 value. And then you have maximum center point temperature varying very slightly, but again, like I mentioned before, it is way above our 950 degrees Celsius that we're trying to uh, achieve, and we'll look at that in the final design. And then finally, we went to the geometry study. Uh, Grayson, can you go? Uh, we went to a geometry study just so that we could finer tune our inputs in order to get closer to our parameters of merit while also minimizing fuel cycle cost. When you have an increase in uh, core volume, which we started with a 196.5 centimeter height all the way up to 550 centimeter height, we did that so we could have a wide range of values so we could appropriately see the trend. Um, we noticed that with an increased core volume, you're gonna have the fuel spending more time inside the core. You're gonna have a higher burn up per fuel. And then with that, again, your fuel cycle cost is decreasing. There is an optimum height that you could look at, but due to our burn up limits, we had to stay within a certain range. Um, now, the maximum center point temperature um, down in the bottom right um, is decreasing with uh, increased core volume. And with an increased core volume, you're going to have um, less power per pebble overall. Therefore, you're going to have a uh, lower maximum center point temperature. And then also, since you're going to have a less uniform uh, distribution of power, you're going to have an increase in the power density peaking factor. Um, so just a culmination of all our uh, parametric studies, we were able to kind of figure out how to tune our inputs, and we got our final design. So we decided upon a 15.5% uh, enrichment, and the main reason we did this was because we wanted to get within that burn-up limit, but at the same time, we want to utilize the same exact fuel enrichment that X Energy is using so that we could reduce our infrastructure costs. We don't have to ask them to and manufacture different types of enrichment. We could just use the same fuel enrichment, same triso particle, same uh, graphite pebble. And like we said before, they use seven grams of uranium per pebble, so that's what we utilized. Core radius remained the same in 90 centimeters, but the core height went up to 280 centimeters. Our uh, maximum center point temperature that I mentioned many times before was a struggle for us. We decided to reduce our inlet temperature. It was initially 250 degrees Celsius. We reduced it to 232 degrees Celsius. And then the mass flow rate actually remained the same. 
And now for our parameters of merit, we were able to get below the 125 gigawatt days per metric uh, per, per ton of a heavy metal. We're able to get below the 1.7 power density peaking factor. And then for our two temperatures, both the uh, maximum center point temperature at steady state was below 950 degrees Celsius. And for our depressurized loss of force coolant design basis accident that Grayson had mentioned before, we are well below the 700 or 1700 degrees Celsius um, metric. And like I mentioned in the pebble pass study, we found the minimum of the fuel cycle cost at eight pebble passes. And then finally, we were able to get a fuel cycle cost of 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour. Now the next few slides, we're just gonna be going over um, a couple heat maps that we generated with our uh, Python script. Uh, we were able to uh, show neutron flux, um, temperature profiles, and some power density peaking profiles. So this is the group-wise in-core neutron flux distribution. On the left, you have the fast flux region. You have the epithermal uh, region and the two center ones. And then on the right, you have the thermal flux region. Now, thermal flux is going to be the one that's going to be the most apparent in change because we're dealing with thermal neutrons. You could see how when the thermal neutrons actually leave the core, they get reflected back in, and you could see some peaking near the edges of the core. Um, and then next, we have the reactor uh, flux distribution. So the center, as you can see, that's where the core is. Um, something to note about the fast flux is that as you um, move further out from the core, the fast flux is actually uh, decreasing exponentially. And um, when that happens, you have less of effect of fast fluence on the reactor components. Um, and then you could again look at the thermal flux and how it's being reflected back into the core and you're seeing uh, higher peaks near the core. Um, finally, we have the uh, I would like to mention the core fluid temperature profile and the fuel center point temperature on the right side. Now these are both bottom peaked. You're um, piping in helium from the top of the core to the bottom. Same thing with the pebbles. They're flowing in the same direction. As you reach the bottom of the core, you're going to have an increase in helium temperature, which will result in a less effective heat transfer, which will cause your um, center point temperature to be increased near the bottom as well. And then related to our thermal fluxes that we showed earlier, you're going to have the power density peaking near the center of the core. All right. So next we have the investigation into the reactivity coefficients. So they were found by using Citation, which is a diffusion solver that takes the temperature inputs that we provide to then yield the temperature reactivity coefficients over our range. Now, as you can see here, that the Doppler reactivity coefficient and the moderator temperature reactivity coefficient are both negative and the reflector is positive. Now, this concern is not as significant because when we have temperature increases in the core, the Doppler effect will then introduce a lot of negative reactivity. And then due to the thermal inertia inside the graphite, it takes a few milliseconds for the moderator to kick in, which will introduce more negative reactivity. And then up to minutes later, the reflector will then increase, introducing positive reactivity. And, with that, and within this time, we've introduced a significant overall negative reactivity over our entire operating envelope, maintaining this design limit of a negative reactivity coefficient. So our next analysis is the design basis accident of the depressurized loss of force cooling. This is similar to that of a large brake loca and an LWR. Now, we did this accident scenario by simply simulating and depressurizing and removing the helium flow in the core. And when we, when, we did these, uh, when we did this, the temperature began to increase and then capped out after seven hours at a temperature of 976.25 degrees. Now this is significantly lower than our temperature of 1700 C. And after this increased, the negative feedback coefficients kicked in and you can see here that the power began to coast down. Now I'd, I'd wanna, I wanna emphasize that this is a worst case scenario so we simulate it without the use of a scram. Now the next section we're going to cover is the economic analysis. So the economic analysis is after we converged our final case and we have our most optimized design, we utilize the VSOP framework to then calculate the average fuel cycle cost. So we supplied the most up-to-date uranium information that we could find, so we found up-to-date spot, conversion, and separative costs. Now the fuel fabrication, the reprocessing, shipping, and storage, and the tails enrichment we were unable to find detailed, up-to-date information, as that is not publicly available at this time. So we used the default values that was provided to us, which then yielded an average fuel cycle cost of 1.1 cents per kilowatt hour. So some further analysis that we could do to help add some value to the economics 
is possibly to incorporate some capital and O&M costs of a prospective research facility and also to perform a cost premium analysis using other enrichments because we say that utilizing 15.5 and reusing infrastructure is good but we don't know how good and so this we will be able to actually compare and contrast different enrichments to see how much we're saving if we're saving anything at all and of course finally to tailor the cost analysis more towards a research reactor because the VSOP framework is tailored towards power generation so there are terms that will introduce uncertainty into our economics calculation that is specifically designed for power generation, not a research reactor. And so to wrap everything up, finally, we have our conclusions. So our design was able to successfully meet all of the specified design limits. And we also found that the fuel enrichment was a very dominant factor in the fuel cycle cost. So we have, of course, geometry, we have uh, pebble passes, those do affect and optimize the fuel cycle cost, but of course enrichment is the most dom dominant factor. And we found here that utilizing the same fuel as the <coughs> XC100 does meet all of our specified limits and would be the most economical as of right now, as of what we know. And we also found that due to our plots, we found that higher burn-up limits would allow us to increase the core height even further and decrease the fuel cycle cost. Now, some future work that we would propose to add more value would be to, again, work with higher burnups and see how the limits of 160 to 180 gigawatt days could affect our, our, our fuel cycle cost, as well as adding some dummy or graphite pebbles into the fuel. These are just unfueled pebbles, as well as varying the fuel enrichment spatially in the core. As of right now, we're simulating just a singular fuel type, so it would be beneficial to see how different fuel types would work, as well as exploring an annular reactor, so a, a more donut-shaped reactor to possibly fit a moderator and or cooling in the center. And of course, performing more uncertainty quantification as we know that there is large amounts of uncertainty in our data and it would be nice to refine this. And another thing that's not listed on here would be possibly to reevaluate these safety limits and introduce more such as uh, fast fluence limits on the core barrel periphery because as we know that there is consistent online refueling, so we always need, we need a core that would last a very long time and the fast fluence could affect and add core damage over time. So thank you guys for your time and do you have any questions? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It's uh, pretty optimistic yeah. in, in my mm -hmm. experience, but I don't, you may have a, a removal strategy that accounts for that. Uh, can you provide some detail? Uh, yeah, that is, um, this accident scenario is just natural circulation at this point. So after we our temperature starts to increase, we see our negative reactivity coefficients kick in, and we have a large negative, negative reactivity insertion. And then our pebbles start to power down, and it's just decay heat, and they're shut off after that. Natural circulation with environment. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just a break. Yeah, it would probably it would be with the environment then. Um, that's not something that we looked into specifically, but uh, it probably would be in there as well, yeah. Yes? Well, how much difference too between your design and the XE100? Mm -hmm. not, not in number, just in general. Yeah, so one th the biggest thing, obviously, in our design is our core is significantly smaller than the XE100 um, because we have a much lower thermal output. <coughs> um, another thing is that they have a they're actually using uh, the higher burn-up limits that we talked about. So their burn-up limits are around the 160 to 180 gigawatt days per metric ton. And because of that, our core design has a much smaller uh, height to diameter ratio than theirs. I believe their height to diameter ratio is closer to four, while ours is closer to two. Um, so if we were able to have those much higher uh, burn-up limits that we talked about, we would actually probably see 
a core height to diameter ratio much closer to theirs as well. So it would probably look a bit more like just a smaller version of the XC100 rather than ours, which is um, smaller and also shorter. And uh, I think in one of the slides, you mm -hmm. saw that uh, you have to make the tool longer. Yes. But maintain the plane. And that intrigued me immensely. I mm -hmm. thought that there would be a ratio change in both. Okay. Um, let's see. I think you had like 120 kilograms per second, if I remember. I believe it's around 7. 7. Yeah, I just don't know. I'm, I'm making a mistake of the number, but the, the thought is that yes. it, yeah, it didn't change. Mm -hmm. That was just an assumption that we made in our model. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, more detailed design of this would have to look into that, how that would affect our, our pressure difference at the top of the core throughout the core. But in our design, this was just something that we assumed a constant flow rate between all these models. Did you sell this design? I think we need to do a bit more uh, work on this, uh, a bit more refinement as well, because in our design, we assume that our reactor is just rectangular. In reality, you have actually a curved region at the bottom of a, a pebble bed reactor to allow the pebbles to flow outside of the core. And then we would also want to look into the, the uncertainty quantification to see you know, how accurate our design is really going to be, as well as uh, the safety limits like we talked about. And what's the thing you don't like about this design? Uh, probably the burn-up limit being much lower than we can go is the biggest drawback in this design. Um, because if we were able to go to this higher burn-up limits, like we said, uh, we could have a much taller core, which would also decrease our maximum center point temperature during operating conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have another question. question over here. I have a question. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think more than time for it. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> so in your, in your literature review, yes. um, you <coughs> are using about uh, the variability of Earth. So obviously pebbles don't, they don't they're the multimodal distribution of burnouts as they may be in the core. So they certainly could make that play. Mm -hmm. The leading, I apologize, it's a leading question. Yeah. So our, our um, code does not handle that. It actually is, this uh, burn-up you can actually look at as more of an average burn-up in the core, as opposed to looking at the extremities of different ones. Um, so it kind of assumes that m the pebbles after their first pass are kind of jumbled up together and redistributed in the core evenly so that they should all get approximately about the same burn-up, but I know that is a big issue in monitoring the actual burn-up in each pebble. And that's an open question. Yes. Quick question about your fabrication process. Yep. Yes. I can, I can quick touch on that. So that was simply provided to us by X Energy. We had the we have a default case that we worked with. I mean, I tried. So the I tried uh, requesting new ones, but of course, that's some of that stuff is not publicly available. Uh, we do have. I assume it was triso. Yes, it is. Tri yeah, it is. It is triso fuel fabrication. The. I know that the Triso X facility is being the new one that's proposed to being built in Oak Ridge. Maybe in time, after they become more established, we could request some detailed information and perform our cost premium analysis, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I have another question? Yeah, just, I'm, just, I'm curious. Yeah. So you got the fuel cost there. Do you have estimates of just of, of, uh, of CapEx and, uh, and OpEx? This is just operating, not necessarily so, the we performed a literature review of some very old models, and I looked at them, and we it was very brief. Um, I, it, the level of uncertainty would be very, very high, especially with the ones that they considered the you know, much larger scale. And of course, back in the day, they did things a little bit differently. So our costs would be extremely inflated, not only because of inflation, but because of other costs as well. But a great question. That is something we could look into. You're not going to find a lot. Yeah. No. <laughs> I get it. That's no. why I said yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So in your economic analysis, um, your, the, the end number you gave was a dollar per kilowatt hour. Um, but this is a research reactor. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, um, so part of the VSOP framework is built to model power reactors, and this kind of cost estimate does assume that it is a power reactor, and that's another big issue in our model. Um, it would be kind of difficult for us to to model some an actual expenses and stuff of this research reactor and actual profits because uh, we don't know what kind of experiments would be going on in there. Something that another group would could do in the future, and I would suggest as be valuable, is to actually discuss, uh, you know, maybe the economics of the Polestar reactor, how the Polestar reactor makes money and operates with uh, Dr. Hawari, but that was not something that we had time to do. One more question. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings a whole bunch of issues with the carbon dynamics. Um, how do you plan, or are there ways that there are plans to figure out these carbon dynamics, figure out different burnouts of the nuclear core, and um, be able to simulate that? And are there also ways that are planned to control pebble flow through the core? So, yeah, so one thing is that. VSOP does model pebble flow through the core. I want to make sure that's clear. Um, it, it just assumes that it's, it's all like the same. Um, if we wanted to model the individual behavior of each pebbles, that would take a much more computationally expensive uh, program. It might require something like Monte Carlo, a PIG, or um, as he mentioned, you know, molecular dynamic simulations. And that's definitely like pretty far beyond the scope of our project. Um, but for enrichments, uh, can you repeat the part of your question about relating to enrichments really quick then? So, to be able to really Sure. Um, so, one of the one, one part of our model and is a relatively common assumption in pebble bed reactors is that the fuel pebbles actually flow in distinct channels. Um, so, in ours, we have five channels of equal volume. Uh, so, we start with a channel in the center, which is just a cylinder, and then we have four annular channels after that. Um, and part of the assumption is that those pebbles do not mix in between channels. And that's how we would model it. Um, that assumption is used because it is actually seen to be what the behavior of pebble bed reactors is. Um, if you wanted to ensure something like this, uh, you could probably have thin dividers between the channels in your, in your actual reactor design of some kind of metal. Um, but that would be my best uh, guess of how you'd actually want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's also an open question of uh, how do we me precisely measure and uh, keep track of each individual pebble. Um, that's something that, you know, lots of people are working on right now. So we're going. 